Okay, uh, very well. Good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, school on mathematical and computational aspects of uh, deep learning. This activity is funded by the Italian Ministry of Education. It's a special program called uh, Dipartimenti di Eccellenza. And uh, one of the goals of uh, our project in PISA is also to gain uh, more expertise on this topic, uh, given also that uh, we have already locally in PISA some expertise on optimal transport probability and uh, computational uh, mathematics. And so I'm sure that uh, this school will be very successful for this purpose. And I give the word to the main organizers, the real organizers, uh, Michele Benzi and uh, For the record, he is Luigi Ambrosio, who is the director of the Scuola Normale. <laughs> yes, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, very, very happy to see so many faces uh, here today. Um, so the uh, school, uh, as uh, uh, Luigi uh, said, is, uh, is part of a series of initiatives that are funded uh, through this uh, um, Department of Excellence uh, initiative of the Ministry of Higher Education. So I would like uh, briefly to thank uh, also the, uh, all the members of the organizing and scientific committee, Luigi Ambrosio, uh, Pierluigi Contucci, and uh, Fabrizio Lillo. Uh, I am Michele Benzi, by the way, I'm also one of the organizers. And uh, um, I would like to thank, uh, of course, the lecturers for accepting the invitation. Uh, unfortunately, there is a change in the program. Uh, Professor Stefano Soato uh, is unable to attend, and uh, so all of the lectures um, will be given by Alessandro Achille. And uh, we're fortunate, in fact, that we have this arrangement uh, so that um, we will not miss out uh, on the lectures that were prepared uh, jointly. Uh, I would also like to thank the staff of the Centro de Giorgi. Uh, it's been extremely helpful, as you know, uh, in logistics and setting up things. Um, I don't really have many announcements uh, other than uh, to say that uh, the cafeteria, uh, for those of you who have access to it, is located um, behind the Scuola Normale. Uh, for uh, most of the participants, of course, uh, uh, you will be on your own for lunch. Uh, this a wide variety of restaurants and uh, excellent sandwich uh, shops uh, nearby. Uh, you should have the information in, in your packet. Uh, with this, uh, um, I would like to uh, give the floor to Pierluigi Contucci, who will uh, briefly introduce uh, the first uh, of the lecturers. Thank you, Michele, and welcome you all. Our first speaker is uh, uh, Jean Barbier. It's a pleasure to have uh, Jean with us. I'm sure many of you have mistaken him or will mistake him with one of the participants due to his young age. He has a tie, that's right. So uh, Jean is one of the uh, researchers studying uh, machine learning with an approach which comes from statistical physics. and. Uh, um, he's now at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, so he's one of those, uh, uh, not in the brain drain for Italy, but in the brain gain, <laughs> and uh, we are very happy of that. Um, he has obtained his PhD in 2015, so he are really young and uh, at uh, Ecole Normale in Paris with the group of uh, Marc Mezar, Lenka Zdeborova, and uh, uh, Florent Kragzala. Uh, after that, he uh, spent a couple of years in, uh, in Lausanne, EPFL, and now he is in um, full steam in Trieste, working on these research uh, topics. I think I let you the floor. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to this school. So my course will be, as um, Chaluji mentioned, it will be at the, there will be a lot of statistical physics, but not only. It will be a mixture of tools from statistical mechanics, but as well from information theory. Uh, I will use vocabulary coming from signal processing, from machine learning, so it will be mixed. So. My 
my main aim is, is to try to show you that all these, these fields are actually connected very deeply and we'll do a, a big effort in trying to, to, to use all the vocabulary but make connections between these, these different fields. So if you have a computer, please uh, go to the web page of the, of, the web of the school and on the link to, to my course there are notes now. So I wrote a quite detailed manuscript where you can find anything. So if you want just to relax and listen, uh, there is no problem because you have there all the computations in much more detailed way than what I will write. Okay? So when I skip computations and I just say, this is an exercise, this is easy, you have actually the computations in these notes. Okay? And all the figures are there. Unfortunately, I cannot choose the screen and the blackboard at the same time. So when I re refer to a figure, maybe you can have a look uh, to the computer if you want to. All right. So, so there will be two uh, main questions that uh, we, we will explore in this course, which are the following. The first one is, when does data contains enough information so that it can be used to infer something about the process that generated this data. Okay? So this is a question actually that you ask when you do information theory. This is the main question in information theory. Okay? And then we'll ask a, a second question which is more an engineering algorithmic question which is can we optimally extract this information from the data at low computational cost so now we take into account the performance of the algorithm in order to perform efficient inference about the data generating process. Okay, so there is a first question which is really establishing the limits of extraction of information. And we'll try to, to first properly define what is information. And then we'll see how to do it efficiently. Okay? Perfect. So before starting, uh, I've understood that the, the crowd is very mixed. I would like to know how many of you are familiar with statistical mechanics. Please raise the, the hand. Okay, so let's say half. Who are familiar with information theory? What is Shannon entropy, this, this type of objects? Half, okay. And who is uh, familiar with what is inference? Okay, so anyway, I'll, re-explain a bit all these concepts quite quickly. So in, in one hour I want to do uh, a, le uh, a lot, so I, I'll, I'll be actually very fast at the beginning, but again you can find everything in these notes. All right. So just notation-wise, um, I will use the, the information theory notations, which means that I will use big letters for random variables and little letters for their outcome, the realizations, okay? Uh, in the notes, you can see that the big letters that are in bold are vectors, uh, matrices, tensors, whatever. Uh, when they're not bold, they are scalars. Unfortunately, on the blackboard, I won't be able to, to make the, the difference, but when you're lost, you can have a look there. And anyway, from the context, you will understand. So. All right. So let us start with the basics. This course is about limits of inference, but what is inference? So there is uh, an important distinction to do between what we call forward and backward. Back. Probability. So Forward probability is the usual probability. It means that you have some parameters, what I will call x, okay, from which, through a random process, which is this arrow here, generates some data, y, okay? Uh, and in forward probability, essentially, you know the parameters. They are fixed. So think about an, uh, the exercise of ball and boxes. Uh, you want to, to you draw uh, balls of a given color in, in urns, 
And for example, the parameters in this case could be the number of black and white balls in the urns, the number of urns and so on. And the process is drawing this, these balls and the data would be, for example, the number of black balls that you, you draw. Okay? So you know the parameters and you want to compute the probability of various statistics of the data. Okay? So in this case, I put a capital Y, which means that the data is random. Conceptually, the random experiment didn't take place and you want to predict what's going to happen. Okay? You know this, you want to predict the data. So this is forward probability. As opposed to that, there is backward probability. Okay? In this case, the parameters of the problem are unknowns. Okay? You know the data, so this is why I put it on the left, and you want to reverse the process to find the parameters from which this data has been generated. Okay? So this is backward probability. This is an inverse problem, and this is the type of problems we are interested in in inference. Okay? So conceptually here, the, the random experiment took place already. You get data, which is fixed, okay, that I give you, and you want to recover the parameters. These are the unknowns. Okay? So how to do inference, the proper way, is through the so-called Bayes formula. Okay? So the, the beginning will be very basic. So I'm sorry if it's a bit boring for some of you, but I would like everything to be uh, clean at the beginning. So how to combine uh, the, the knowledge that we gain from the data about the parameters? Okay, so the way we model this random process it th is through the so-called likelihood function. So the likelihood that we denote like this is by definition the conditional probability of the data given the parameter. But this is not the way you should interpret it. Here is a subtle point. I mean, subtle. The likelihood, you have to think of it, and this is why we use this notation, really as a function of the parameters. You should not think in terms of the probability of the data given the parameters, because the data is fixed. So you should really think in terms of this notation. The data are parameters of a function, and this function has argument the parameters x that you want to infer. Okay? So you should never say the likelihood of the data given the parameter, actually. You should say the likelihood of the parameters given the data. Okay? So this likelihood models if you want the data generating process, it models the noise, the way the data is acquired, and so on. Then maybe you know something about the parameters before acquire, acquiring the data. Okay? Maybe you know, for example, the domain in which lives the parameter. Okay? Or maybe you know that it is Gaussian distributed or whatever. You know that it is bounded, for example. All this information is encompassed into the so-called prior. Okay? This distribution should never depend on the data, and it should never change once the data has been acquired. Okay? It's something you know a priori about the, the parameters, that I will also call the signal. These parameters, we we'll use the, the language from signal processing and call them signal. This prior only depends on x. Okay? And the way to combine what we get from the data and what we a priori know is through the Bayes formula which tells us that the probability that the parameters which are seen as random variables take actually value little x given the data we know, which is fixed, is what? It's the prior distribution times the likelihood divided by the normalization. And this normalization, which is the probability of the data independently of anything else, is called the evidence. Okay? All right. So, in classical statistics, we are usually interested in regimes where you have a lot of data 
in order to infer few parameters. Okay, so if I call If I call M the number of data points we have access to, classical statistics is generally interested in this setting where N is the number of parameters you want to infer. Okay? This is not the type of problems we'll consider in this course. What we'll be interested in are high dimensional problems, which means essentially that you have a lot of data, big amount, but the number of parameters you want to infer is also huge. Okay? and are comparable actually. So usually high dimensional limits is something like this, where this notation means that it scales exactly like n. Okay? <coughs> it's not always the case. We will see that in particular in the problem that we will focus on during this course, this is not the proper high dimensional limit. But this is what you can keep in mind essentially. The, the number of data points must, must scale like the number of parameters. Okay? Okay, so this type of regime is related to all these, you know, machine learning applications, this big data that you hear about now uh, all the time. This is the type of scaling that matters in this case. Actually, in modern neural networks, uh, I won't discuss much neural networks, but what I will present also applies to study of particular settings of neural networks. Uh, we are even sometime in a regime where the number of data points is much lower than the number of parameters you want to learn, which represent, for example, the weights in the neural network. So a priori, this should lead to a strong overfitting. But this is not the case. Actually, these neural networks learn pretty well, if even if you should be a priori able to fit the noise. Why it does not happen is really a question at the forefront of research in this field. Okay, and we won't answer this question here. Okay, so we are talking about reconstructing signals, parameters, but what does it mean? So how do, you qu how do we quantify how good we reconstruct this signal? We need to define some metric, okay, some, e some measure of error. And the way we, so the process we will do now is to define a metric and from there we'll derive what's the optimal algorithm, what's the best way to estimate the parameters given that we want to optimize this metric. And the way to do that is through what we call Bayesian decision theory. So imagine that your estimator, which is the output of an algorithm, is this x hat. Okay, so in signal processing, we always use this hat notation to, for the estimator of some algorithm. So it is the output of some algorithm, and this algorithm takes as input the data. And the data is itself a function of the parameters you want to infer. Okay? Let's say that our goal. Our ultimate goal is to minimize some measure of error that depends on this estimator and on the true parameters. This is called the loss. <coughs> loss or energy function or cost function or objective, all that is the same thing. Okay? Energy, because in physics you want to minimize the energy and here we want to minimize the loss. Okay? So this loss is a function of x hat and the true parameter. For example, the one we will mainly focus on uh, is the so-called square loss. Which is this object. And our goal is to minimize this object. So obviously, how to minimize this thing? It's just to take as an estimator the true parameters. Okay? But of course, you don't know the true parameters. This is all the point. Okay? So in some way we have to approximate this loss. Okay? Because we don't have access to it. We don't have access to x. How to optimally approximate this loss? From what I said before. Is to use the posterior distribution. Okay? The posterior distribution is the optimal way to gather the data and our a priori knowledge. So from the loss 
you define the risk. And the risk, by definition, is the expectation with respect to the posterior distribution of The expected with respect to the posterior, the expectation with respect to the posterior of the loss. Okay? And now this object is something you can at least formally compute. Because this is now only a function of the data and of this estimator. Okay? So maybe it's computationally very intensive to compute this object. It might be very difficult to compute this expectation. And usually this is the case. This is a very high dimensional integral. Okay? For example, if, if your signal here lives in n dimensions, it's a very complicated object. But if you would have access to a very performant computer, you could run it for a very long time, a priori you could compute the risk. Okay? For all this first part, we do not consider the, the computational uh, problem. Okay? We always assume we have access to a very uh, efficient algorithm. So you can compute this risk. All right. So in the case of this loss, this risk is the so-called mean square error okay. Now we have an object that, now that we have an object that we can compute, our goal is to minimize this risk okay. I'm computing the minimum of this risk and I set it to zero And I directly get so this risk this risk is convex in this object so there is a single minimum which tells us that the optimal estimator that depends only in the data which is by definition the arg mean of this mean square error is what? It's the posterior mean. Okay? Is it clear? So I just set this object to zero. Okay? And I obtain that this should be equal to this. Okay? So if you want to minimize the mean square error, what you should do is to sample the posterior and to compute, it, to, to compute its mean. Maybe it's very difficult, and actually it is. We will see that there are efficient ways to do it, but at the moment we don't care. This is what you should do. This is what information theory tells you to do. Okay? So if you do the same exercise starting from another loss, for example, this loss, so this loss is only happy, is minimized when your estimator is perfectly reconstructed the, the, the signal. Okay? So you really want to perfectly get the signal. In this case, you do the same thing. You take the expectation with respect to the posterior distribution. So you define a risk. You minimize the risk. And what you obtain in this case is that the optimal estimator with respect to this loss, in this case, is the argmax of the posterior distribution.
And this, so our previous estimator was called the minimum mean square estimator because it was minimizing the mean square error. This one is called the MAP estimator, which means maximum a posteriori. Okay? So depending on which loss you want to optimize, this tells you, this Bayesian decision theory tells you what should you compute. Okay? So from now on, we'll, we'll, our goal will be always to minimize the mean square error. Okay? Let me just come back here to the expression of the mean square error. Let's see that it can be written in different ways. So this. So maybe you are interested in average performance, OK? You're not interested in what you would get for a given realization of the data. Maybe you want to average over the data to see what happens in expectation. So then you can define the minimum mean square error, which now is independent of the data, which I will also note like this. You will see why. So what it is, it is the expectation with respect to the data, the expectation with respect to the posterior of the square loss, evaluated for the optimal estimator that I will note, I will use a notation that I will use all, all along this course, which is this bracket notation. Okay. So this bracket means always the expectation with respect to the posterior. Okay. We'll always arrange things with respect to the posterior, so we use this uh, this, uh, this notation, which comes actually from statistical physics, this is called a Gibbs bracket. So, and big X like this will always be used to mean a sample from the posterior. Okay? So, when you have a big X inside the bracket, it means this object. So, this bracket is a function of the data. Okay? This is a function of the data. So, keep, keep that in mind. Okay? So, our expected minimum mean square error, so the average minimum mean square error, is the expectation of the minimum mean square error for the optimal estimator. Okay. And by the base rule, I can also write this like this. Okay, so what I used here is that P, it's just a rewriting of the base rule, is P of X, PY given X, which is also PY, PX given Y. Okay, it's just a rewriting of the base rule that we also call the product rule. Okay. But here, I will use another notation just to distinguish between samples from the posterior distribution and with a variable that represents the ground truth signal that you want to infer. I will call this x, which now is only a sample from the prior distribution, not anymore from the posterior like here. So I will put a star to emphasize that this guy is sample from the prior. Okay. And when I don't put a star, it means that it's a sample, this x is a sample from the posterior. OK? So this x, this x star really conceptually plays the role of the signal that you want to infer. OK? Now we understand this notation. This is the minimum mean square error for the ground truth given the data. Okay? So this average minimum mean square error 
is written equivalently. I just re rewrite the same thing, but more compactly. Okay, where this expectation is over x star, which is distributed according to the prior, and y given x star, which is the likelihood. Okay? But this is the same thing as this expression, which is the variance of the likelihood. Okay? The expectation with respect to y of the variance of the likelihood, which explicitly is this thing. Okay? I have an outer expectation with respect to the data. Sorry. Uh, yes. I have an outer expectation with respect to the ground truth and the data given the ground truth, which is the same thing as just the expectation with respect to the data. Okay. Okay, this, this integral is nothing else than p of y. Okay. Of the variance of the like of the minimum mean square estimator. So this is the variance of the likelihood. Is it clear? There is a one over n. Okay, so if it's not clear, tell me now because now notation wise I'll I'll go on and I mean, it should be clear, otherwise you will be lost quickly. Is it for everyone? Yes? Okay. So each time I use this star notation, keep in mind that I refer to the ground truth signal you want to infer, the true parameters, while when I use a little x or big x, which in this case is random, I refer to a sample from the posterior distribution given the data. Okay? So. This minimum mean square error, in physics, this is what we call an observable. Okay? This is something you can observe about the system you are, uh, that you are uh, considering. And this minimum mean square error, we, we will see that it has phase transitions. Sometimes it will be high, sometimes it will be small. And at certain points, for example, if I increase the level of noise in the task, okay, if the data is becoming more and more noisy, at some point, this minimum mean square error will, will be high, okay? At a certain point, which is called a phase transition. And this is the type of phenomenon that we want to understand. But you could tell me, okay, why, why focusing on this one, not on the map estimator, the other, which is associated to another loss, for example? At the end, it doesn't really matter, because whatever observable you consider, whatever uh, error uh, you, 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 you compute, the point where they will suddenly become bad, the phase transition points does not depend on the error that you're considering. Phase transitions are intrinsic properties of the system under interest. And this is just a, w a way to, to measure it, to locate it. It's like in physics, if at zero degrees Celsius, you go from liquid to solid, you can see the phase transition by measuring, for example, the mean displacement of the atoms or the correlation length. And these two quantities will suddenly change at the same point. It's just two ways to measure it. Okay? So this is one way that we will use, but you could consider another way. This wouldn't change the, the global picture. Okay? <coughs> All right, so let's now see. An important consequence of the Bayes formula which will uh, allow us to, to, to obtain many simplifications and essentially to fully analyze this type of problems, this type of high dimensional inference problems. All right, so consider, so I will now discuss the so-called Nishimori identities 
which is nothing else than a direct consequence of the base formula. Okay? So consider two random variables, a couple x, y, that they can be vectors, tensors, they can be whatever you want, okay? that are drawn from a joint distribution, Pxy. And now consider um, k greater than 1 and random variables x1 to xk, which are all drawn independently through the conditional distribution. And if we think of this y as the data and x as the parameters, this is the posterior distribution. Okay? So these guys, in physics, we call them replicas. They are independent draw from the same posterior distribution. Okay? And this distribution in physics is called the gibbs boltzmann distribution. We will see that soon. Okay? All right. So the Nishimori identity tells you that for any bounded function G that might depend on the data on this X that you can think of the true parameters and on these replicas okay so again this expectation is what this is the expectation with respect to the joint law okay and this bracket notation is the expectation with respect to the product measure Okay, it acts on all these replicas. Do you understand this notation? Yes or no? Okay, this notation means P X one given Y, P X two given Y, etc. Okay? So this bracket means that I average over the posterior distribution for all of these replicas independently. It's clear now? Okay. And during all these calls, when I have multiple replicas, so multiple variables that are independently drawn from the posterior distribution, and that appear in the same bracket notation, it means that they are averaged over independently from the same posterior distribution, where the data here is the same. Okay? So these replicas, conditionally on the data, they are independent. Okay? But they share the same data. Okay? But if you condition on Y, they are independent. So the Nishimura identity tells you that this object is the same as this object. So you see, the only difference is that I replaced here the ground truth, the parameters drawn from the joint distribution, by a new replica. Here it started at x2, now it starts at x1. And here the expectation is again over the joint law, and in this case, just with respect to the marginal, because x does not appear anymore explicitly in this expression. Okay. So the proof is trivial. It is the same to sample x, y from their joint distribution or to first sample y according to its marginal distribution and then to sample x according to the conditional distribution. You agree with me? This is just the product rule, okay? The joint is Py, Px given Y, okay? So this object and this object inside are equal in low, okay? 
So maybe I can show it by computation. Let's consider the simplest case. We have G expectation. So the expectation with respect to x, y of a function of x and let's say x1, one replica. I can write this as the expectation with respect to y expectation x given y of the same thing. At the moment, this bracket only applies on this replica. And you see now, because I have an expectation with respect to the posterior, this x plays the role of a replica, plays a symmetric role as this one. They have the same distribution. Okay, so if I want, I can call it, I just recall it x2. Okay, is it clear? So this needs to be clear, it's very important. So if it's not, please tell me. Yes. Why x and x1, x k here separate? Why x and x1 and x k and so on appear in connection? How they connected? Why do they appear separately? Uh, yes. So I'm just writing. This is a function, okay. any function that depends on y, x, and these variables, where each of these variables are drawn independently from the same distribution, which is the posterior distribution. Okay. So x and x1 are totally separate variables. At the moment, there is no x1 here. OK. There is no x1 here. What I just shown to you is that by just applying the base rule, by replacing the expectation with respect to joint distribution, by the expectation with respect to first the data, and then x given the data, I can this x actually plays the same role as this x1. It's, it's, a, it's a new replica. It's a new variable drawn from the posterior distribution. So I can just change its name to emphasize this point, to emphasize that it's drawn from the same distribution as this guy, and I call it x2. Mm. Is, it, is it okay? So, yes. Later, yes, later. So this is really a, it, it, it's a trivial identity to show from the base rule. But actually, it's very crucial in all the rest that I will do. It's fundamental in proving the things that we will prove. Okay? It tells you essentially that because these replicas, they, have, they are drawn from the posterior distribution that you know, okay? They play an exactly symmetric role as this x, as the ground truth signal, if you want. Okay? Inside expectation with respect to everything, the ground truth or a replica, again, a sample from the posterior, plays symmetric roles. You can replace one by the other. Okay? Okay. So actually, we've already seen one application of this identity without realizing, which was the fact that we have shown that the minimum mean square error can be written equivalently like this, or like this. Let's apply this Nishimura identity. Here, inside this Gibbs bracket with the outer expectation with respect to the data, we have a function that depends only on the data because this object 
depends only on the data, it's a function of the data. And this object is drawn from the posterior distribution. Okay? So we have a function of the data and of one replica, if you want, that I, in this case I call just x. Okay? So the Nishimori identity tells me that I can replace this replica by the ground truth. Okay? And this is what I do here. I just replaced this guy by the ground truth. And so this bracket, which is the expectation with respect to the posterior, does not apply anymore on this. So it disappears and I just have the outer expectation that is there over the data. Is it clear? Okay. Let's see another application of the Nishimura identity. Again, we will re-express the minimum mean square error differently. So I will continue there, actually. Here, this is a variant, so I can expand the square. This is the same thing as the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x squared. Okay, I did nothing. And here, excuse, I uh, yes, I have a question. When you use the Nishimori identity uh, for changing the x star to the x, in the Nishimori identity, I guess, when you replace the ground truth for one of the realizations, it's a new one, not one of the other ones. Is this a problem that you put the same one that was already on the expression? I don't understand. You replace x star with x, which is the same realization you are also in the expression above. Here? Yes. But if you, this is a dummy variable, this big x. It's inside an expectation. If you want, I can call it uh, in, with another name. Again, this x here, what does it mean? It means the ex integral dpx over y of x. So this guy here has, is unrelated to this one, for example. Uh, I, is it because it's still a random variable, I guess. It's a random variable of y. But the outer expectation here didn't move. It's still there. OK, I have to think a little bit. It's a known problem that we are doing in this symbol. The people are working in statistics and use that as well. Yes. Yes. It appears everywhere in every seminar. Uh, so it's um, it's a standard problem. So sometimes you have to remind yes, the audience yes. that it does not re depend on x but on yes. y, and that's it. This really is an average. Okay, so this is only a function of the data. Okay, it's clear for everyone. Okay, if you want, I can call it with another name. But keeping the same notation x is just to recall each time that this is a sample from the posterior. So each time I use this x, I mean a sample from the posterior. And inside a bracket, when, I have a, when it's large, it means it's random and it's averaged over the posterior. OK, so this is the variance of the posterior. It's OK? All right. This is the expectation with respect to the data of the variance of the posterior given the data. Okay. So going from there to there, I did nothing. Okay. And here, what do I have? I have a function of a single replica. Okay. This big X. So I can replace this big X because it's inside a full expectation with respect to the data and with respect to the posterior by the ground truth. Okay. So this guy is the same. That's the expectation of x star. Okay? 
So I'm not always, you know, writing with what I take the average, but it should be clear. I always take the average with respect to everything which is inside. Here is the expectation with respect to what is random here, the data only. So this is the expectation with respect to the data. And here, I take the expectation with respect to the x star. Okay? Or if you want the expectation with respect to x star, the data given x star, but because nothing depends on the data, this expectation is just disappearing. Okay? So by Nishimori, I can replace this by this. And I will call this object with the 1 over n. By definition, I call it rho. Okay? This is the second moment of the prior distribution. Okay? So this x star again is drawn from the prior distribution. And I call the second moment rho. Okay? Now what's this part? <coughs> this thing uh, Sorry, here I don't have this square. What's this thing? This is the expectation of the inner product. This is the scalar product between x1 and x2. Okay. Why? Because this is the same as the expectation of x, scalar product expectation of x, and this is the same as expectation of the guild bracket of two independent replica. Okay. Is it clear, this step? And by Nishimori, I can replace one of the two replica by the ground truth. So it's the same as the expectation of the ground truth times scalar product with the expectation of one replica. I replaced x1 by the ground truth, for example. And x2 is this x, which is here. And this is what we call in physics the overlap, where Q is by definition 1 over n, sum of i going from 1 to n, where n is the dimensionality of this vector, of uh, xi, xi star. Okay? So the overlap measures how close is your sample from the posterior, this replica, how aligned it is with the ground truth. Okay? So I have shown again don't worry if you miss a, a computation or something everything is written there. We have shown that the minimum mean square error, the average minimum mean square error can also be written as the second moment of the prior minus the expectation of this overlap. Okay? So this was another application of the Nishimo identity. Okay. So get used to this mechanism because we'll use it a lot. All right. So now, okay, I need to be much much faster. Um, I want to do a 10 minute introduction to what is information theory to motivate the quantity that then we'll compute. We'll try to to compute in this course. So. The point is that we want to precisely quantify. W yes. The way you can substitute this. Sorry. So, 
but you have just stone is uh, convenient because you can just uh, you just measure measure the average of the sino or from the replica will be the same is it what you Sorry, have done? Sorry, say it again. To have the expectation of the sign or of the replica will be the same, and that's because it's convenient for your your loss function. Is this what you have done? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by. I it's mean, convenient. when you get to the physical observable, yes, you're just measuring expectation, right? Uh, yeah, you can measure expectations, and I, I mean, I, I, I just shown equivalence between different expressions at the moment. So but, but physically, we like to work with this object that we call overlap that has a nice physical interpretation as a correlation between a sample from the posterior okay, mm -hmm. and the ground truth signal. So uh, what, I better say, what I was asking is uh, your loss function cannot differentiate from the true sign or this one you have just uh, done with the replica, is it? So, w we have shown that, that the minimum mean square error can be equivalently written mm -hmm. as the s expected square deviation between the ground truth and the mean of the posterior or by the Nishimori identity when I put a big N it means by the Nishimori identity as the variance of the posterior Okay. So the fluctuations of the posterior tells you how good you can reconstruct at best mm -hmm. the signal. Yes. And is it still true if instead of using the spectator, you use a quantile? No, everything I, I say follows from the Nishimura identity, which is only true if you really use the posterior optimally. So okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. It's a special setting. Okay. And this setting is called. Thank, thanks for the question. Actually, I didn't mention that. By Asian, and this is the setting in which we will place ourselves, optimal setting. So all this course will be in this setting, which means that we know the posterior. We know the prior that helped generate the ground truth signal. So we know what's the distribution from which the ground truth signal was generated. This is known. And we know the likelihood. Okay? We know this function, so we know how the data has been generated. What we don't know is really the realization of the signal. Okay? But apart from that, we know perfectly the model. So we are able to write the posterior distribution and to use it. And in this case, the Nishimura identity is valid. Okay? <coughs> All right, so uh, crash course on information theory. So the point of this course is to define absolute limits of inference. When can we, recon can we reconstruct this signal from the data? But, so when is there enough information in the data to say something meaningful. But so what is information at first? So it was understood by Shannon in 1948, who defined the notion of entropy. Okay. So the Shannon entropy. So given a random variable, x, its entropy is by definition sum over all its possible outcome. And this big calligraphic x means all the possible uh, values that takes this random variable x, it's the configuration space of this random variable, of p of x log 1 over p of x, where p is the distribution of this random variable x. Okay? What's that? It's the expectation with respect to p of this function, which is called the information content, or another name that I prefer, which is called the surprise, okay, that we sometimes call little h of x, okay. And why is it called a surprise? Imagine that you 
you generate a draw from this random variable. Okay, you do a random experiment and you observe an outcome. If the outcome, so this little x, has low probability, this object, the surprise is high. Okay, so of course it is more surprising to observe an unexpected outcome, something with a low probability. Okay, if the probability is high, you would bet that this outcome will happen, and so the surprise when you observe it is actually low. Okay, or equivalently, if you observe the outcome, an uh, unprobable outcome, it leads a higher information. Okay, it was unexpected, so it gives you more information. If you observe observe something that you you, w you were expecting, it leads almost no information. Okay, so think of the following. Uh, uh, think of the following. So you're uh, uh, you're in the desert. Okay, it's super hot. Uh, you're alone. You're sweating. You're thirsty, and uh, suddenly it rains like hell. You know, and actually it rains frogs, and then it rains pianos, and okay, it's, it's so this event is so unprobable that it leads an enormous amount of information. And in this case, it should lead you to the conclusion that you're dreaming, okay? Now, you're again in the desert, you're walking, and you see a cactus. Okay, you're in the desert, so this, this had a high probability to happen. So this does not give a lot of information. So you would not realize that you're dreaming, okay? All right. Yes. Okay, so at the moment, Thank you, I didn't mention. I, I'm considering the case where X is discrete. Actually, the Shannon entropy is only defined for discrete variables. There is a notion of differential entropy for continuous variable. But at the moment, let's focus on the discrete case, where the interpretation is much cleaner. Okay? Then we'll, we'll actually introduce another quantity, which happens to be the proper one for continuous variables as well. But let's keep in mind that X is, is discrete at the moment. Okay. So. Uh, What's the interpretation of this Shannon entropy? It's the expected surprise or the expected information gain related to this random variable. So in expectation, this is the information content that you would gain if you observe the outcome of this random variable. Okay? So you have to think of the entropy as, as or the, 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 the information content here, the surprise, as a potential information gain. It means that if you would observe the outcome of this random variable, this is the amount of information that you would gain from this observation. Okay, so it's a potential gain of information. But another interpretation of the entropy, which actually match uh, closer the, the one in statistical mechanics, is a measure of unpredictability of the random variable, of disorder, of lack of knowledge. So it might seem paradoxical because I just told you that it's an expected information gain. Now I'm telling you that it's a measure of lack of knowledge, of uninformation about X, but actually there is no paradox. The point is just to place yourself conceptually before the random experiment took place, before you observed the outcome, or after. If you place yourself before that you observed the outcome, little X from X, from big X, okay, if you place yourself before, a more natural interpretation is of unpredictability. While if you place yourself after you measure the outcome, more natural interpretation is the information that you gained from this observation. So if you want, the, the entropy before observing, it, it, when you observe the outcome of a random vari variable, you, you convert an amount in expectation, you convert an amount big H of X of uninformation into actual information when you observe the outcome. Is it clear? So there is no paradox. It's just if you prefer to think before or after the experiment took place and that you observe the outcome. So these two definitions, these two interpretations of uh, expected information gain and unpredictability of the random variable actually are just in one same definition. Okay, so this entropy verify an, verifies a number of nice properties, nice for a measure of information. I will not give them all, you can find them in the notes. Maybe the, the most important one 
is that if x and y are independent, this notion means independent. What does it mean independent? It means that the joint probability is just the product of the marginals. Okay. In this case, the entropy of the couple is just the sum of the entropies. Okay. Of course, if the variables are independent, what you gain as information when you measure the two is what you get when you measure one and then the other. Okay? Because they are uncorrelated anyway. Okay? This is one of the key properties of the entropy. The entropy is minimum when the variable is deterministic. So the entropy is always non-negative and the bound is uh, saturated, so it's zero when x is deterministic, which means that there is at least one pi, uh, not at least, there is one pi equal to one. The variable is not random. Okay? Okay? Otherwise, it's always positive. There is nothing as negative information. If I tell you something, you, you cannot lose information. Okay? Maybe what I tell you is wrong, but it will not, you will not lose what you already know, okay? All right, so... Another important property of the entropy is the chain rule for entropy. So if I define the conditional entropy of x given y, it is the sum over x and y okay. Uh, then the entropy of the joint law of the couple xy is the entropy of x given y, the conditional entropy, plus the entropy of y. Okay? So the unpredictability of the couple is the unpredictability of the first random variable y plus the remaining un unpredictability of x given that you already know y. Okay? Or equivalently, the amount of information that you gain in expectation when you measure the two random variables is the one you gain when you first measure y and what you would gain measuring afterwards x given that you already measured y. Okay? So this, this is called the chain rule for, for uh, entropy. Okay? So, okay, I tried to convince you that the entropy is a proper measure of information content. But maybe I could have created other functions with the same properties. Okay? Maybe there are tons of other ones actually. So why is the entropy actually the proper definition of information content? So this is, to understand that, and this is what understood Shannon, who led the basis of information theory thanks to this result, this is the so-called source coding theorem, which is absolutely crucial, probably as important as conservation of energy in physics. So, so from now on, I want to discuss source coding. So forget what I told you, okay? Let's fake that we don't know the entropy is the proper measure of information content. It's just a mathematical definition at, at the moment. I define the function. And we want to show that this function is actually the proper definition of information content. And to do that, we need to understand what is lossy compression. I need to know, do, do you know these things? Is it, I can, no? It's new for, uh, for, okay, so I continue. So 
So let's say we have a discrete random variable x that has some distribution p and that takes values, the outcome take value, the outcome of this random variable take value in this space which is x1, x2 and so on. Okay? One naive way to define the information content of this random variable is through the so-called row bit content. Row bit content. The row bit content, h0 of x, is defined as the log, let's say log 2, of the cardinality of the configuration space of this random variable. So I didn't mention that. The, the entropy, depending on the basis in which you use the log, okay, when I define the entropy, I use log, I didn't uh, specify the, the basis. If you use the natural logarithm, the entropy is, is in, in nats. The units of the entropy are called nats, which means natural units. But usually in information theory, we prefer to use the log two basis, in which case the entropy is interpreted in, in bits, number of bits you need to, to, to represent this object. Okay, the number of binary variables you need to represent this uh, object. So here, the, the row bit content is what? It's the number of binary variables I need to map all the entries of this space on two binary strings. Okay? Indeed. Okay? So I, do, I did nothing. I just, if you want, conceptually I converted the entries which are there into binary strings. And this counts the number of binary variables I need to represent all these binary strings. Okay? This is the raw bit content. But maybe it's not a very smart way to, to quantify information because I didn't take into account any probabilities of these events. I just coded these entries on two binary strings. I did nothing. Just took another representation, binary representation, because we like to work with bits in information theory. Maybe so co consider the following. Take the A, I think this is uh, ASCII -A is the, the alphabet that we use on the computers. Okay, imagine that from this alphabet, which is the original alphabet for your random variable, the random variable in this case is the letter that you type, I remove some symbols. I remove this symbol, I remove this symbol, I remove, uh, I don't know, uh, this and uh, this symbol, uh, this symbol. In this case, we would have problems in this course because we like very much this symbol. But okay, for a normal uh, person, if I remove these symbols from the alphabet and I define a compressed alphabet by just removing these ones from this original one, okay, let me call it compressed. With high probability, you will understand all your mails, you will understand all the documents that are on your computer. Okay? So in some sense, these, these symbols, they must carry less information, they are less important. Okay? Because their probability to occur is actually much smaller than the E, the A. If I remove these symbols from the alphabet, actually you will be in trouble. You essentially lose the information on your computer. Okay? So because these ones are less probable, in some way they must matter less. Okay? So let's try to formalize this idea. Okay, so one lossy compression method, lossy in the sense that we allow some loss of information, but we will quantify exactly what do we mean by that, is the following. Take all the entries, all the possible symbols that are in your original alphabet, okay, and you rank them by decreasing probability, okay? Okay, this, sim this symbol has probability P1, this symbol has probability P2, and so on. So you rank them. And you define a new compressed alphabet by just keeping the most probable ones. And you define the so-called delta essential
the smallest delta essential subset uh, x delta, which is by definition the smallest subset such that the probability that x does not belong to this subset is less than delta, or equivalently, the probability that it is in this subset is greater than 1 minus delta. Okay? So I just keep the most probable symbols. So this process is called source coding. Okay? You take an alphabet, you compress it, you define a new alphabet, so you compress your source. Okay? Your random variable. So doing so, you take a risk. You take a risk that maybe there, there are symbols from the original alphabet, from the original alphabet that do not have a, a representation in the new alphabet. Actually, this is the case. But this risk is quantified by this delta. This is called the risk. Okay? It's the risk that there is a symbol in the original alphabet that does not have a representation in the new alphabet, that you lost the information related to this symbol. Okay? It's clear? This new alphabet is called a code. Okay? This is your code. Maybe if you can represent this code in binary form, in binary strings, this does not change anything. Okay, this is just a matter of representation. What matters is the number of symbols that are in this new set. Okay? Now, maybe a smarter measure of information content is then to define the raw bit content for this delta essential subset. Smallest delta essential subset. So, this defines the delta essential bit content of x. It is by definition, the log 2 of the cardinal of the smallest delta essential subset. Okay? It's the number of bits you need to represent this new alphabet. Okay? So now the question, so it, it, it sounds like a reasonable measure of information because you compressed your alphabet and maybe if the risk is small, okay, maybe you removed a lot of symbols, the risk is still small, and therefore, what remains in the new alphabet should contain pure information in some way. Because if you were removing more symbols from it, the risk would suddenly increase a lot, which means that you would lose information. Okay? Make sense? Okay? But there is a problem. A very uh, nasty property of this object that, that makes it not a proper definition of information content which is that this object strongly depends on the risk. So if you have uh, the notes, uh, okay, I will draw the picture. For example, if you plot this quantity, typically, look at the cardinal of this subset, typically it will be step function like this when I increase the risk. So I remove symbols, and this thing is not, I mean, it, there is no special value delta where you see something where you could say, okay, this is where I should cut. This is the risk that really defines information. Okay? So you don't know what to do, okay? The, so this is actually what understood Shannon. There is a way to overcome this difficulty. This is where really his genius uh, enters in. It's to change a bit the setting and instead to consider a long source that generate independent outcomes of the same random variable. So let me call xn a string x1, x2, xn where all these x1, x2, xn are IID outcomes of the same random variable x, okay? Now the question becomes, so why do we care about this 
construction. So this is what, what Shannon called call really the source. Okay, it's this string of IID outcomes. Why should we care about this object? The point is that whatever information means, at the moment we, we don't really know what it means, but whatever information means, one key property that it should have is that it's additive for independent variables. Okay, otherwise, uh, I mean, we have a problem. And in this case, we have independent variables. So, whatever is the definition of information, the information contain, content of this source should be n times the one of x. Is it clear? Okay. And the second point is that we look at what happens when n gets large and by the law of large numbers there will be simplifications. Okay, some magic will happen. Okay. So the point now is what is the delta essential bit content of this source? So we want to define h delta of this source which is the log 2 of this object. Okay, so this is the configuration space for these strings. So it's just n times the configuration space of the original variables. Okay, this notation is clear. And this is the delta essential, the smallest delta essential subset associated to this random variable, which is now a string. Okay? So we look at the the row bit content of this smallest delta essential set. And uh, can we compute it and does it uh, make sense? And actually the point is yes, because now if you plot this object, Okay, as a function of delta, you realize that when n is not so big, we still have this step behavior like this, which was the, the problem we had. But when it's getting large, what happens is that this function becomes smoother and smoother. And in the limit, it really tends to a line like this, except very close to the border where delta is equal to 1 and around 0. But really in the limit of n going to infinity, this really becomes infinitely flat like this. Okay? So it concentrates onto a value. Okay? And the point is that this value is related to the entropy. So let's state the source coding theorem, which really tells us that the entropy is the proper definition of information content. So consider, so this is the source coding theorem consider this source, which are made of IID outcomes of the same random variables. Now consider any arbitrarily small epsilon. Consider any delta, any risk between 0 and 1. Cannot be 0 or 1, but it can be any value in between. There exists a positive integer that depends on your choice of epsilon and on delta such that if n is greater than this guy then the delta essential bit content of the string is the entropy of x. Okay? So, what does it mean, this result? 
says that whatever level of compression you consider, whatever risk delta you consider, as long as you allow yourself a bit of risk, a, a small probability of making mistakes, so you compress at least a bit, then you, you can compress up to the entropy. Okay? But even if you allow yourself to compress a lot, you allow yourself a high risk, which is very close to 1, but independent of n, you still can compress only up to the entropy. So this quantity becomes independent of the compression rate of this risk, delta. So suddenly, this has a very nice property, which is that it's a fixed number that is independent of your compression scheme. Which means that really, what the, the information contained in this string should be n times hx, which means that the entropy per bit, per, sorry, per entry of this string should be h of x. Is it clear? It's a deep thing. <laughs> it's a very deep thing. It's a, it's a beautiful result. Okay, so let me give you an... <laughs> okay. uh, let me give you an idea of the proof. Or not. Okay, so <laughs> you have an idea of the proof in the notes. Okay, the point is, okay, I do it because it's beautiful. The point is that when n gets large, okay, only typical realizations of this string may appear. Okay, it's a large deviation effect. All the, the outcomes that are not typical, they, you, will not, you will never observe them. So when you compress your, your alphabet, which means the xn, Essentially, you need only to keep these typical instances, okay? Typical instances, what's their probability? The probability of the typical instances is something like, so typically, for example, if the string is made of Bernoulli 0, 1 uh, variables, yes? This is, this is, just, just no, this is the space of configurations for the string of length n. You have like a string consistent of n characters. Yes, what you mean by yes, yes. So, typically, if you, let's, let's think in terms of Bernoulli random variable zero ones, typically you should have, if, if x is a Bernoulli p, you should have n p ones, and n 1 minus p zeros, okay? And actually when n is getting large, the variance, so this, this implies that xn, uh, the number of ones is a rent, so the number of ones that I will call r is a binomial random variable with parameters n and p. And the variance of this binomial distribution scales as 1 over square root of n. So only realizations where you have order np ones may appear. The other ones they have a vanishing probability. Okay? So you only to code these ones. Okay? You only to keep this one, you only need to keep these ones in the in the new alphabet, in the new representation. And actually. So the number of typical realizations scales exponentially with n, okay? Which means that even if you keep a small fraction of this typical realization, so you allow yourself a high risk, okay? You allow yourself a lot of mistakes. You still need to keep at leading order, at exponential order, the same number of uh, realizations, okay? Because 1 billion to the billion, to, well, 10 to the power n divided by uh, 100 is 10 to the power n minus epsilon, and therefore at leading order it changes nothing. Okay? So essentially, the number of typical realizations you need to code in defining your compressed alphabet does not depend on delta. Okay? Now the question is can we count, can we compute 
this cardinal which is the number of such typical realizations and the answer is yes because one typical realization has a probability for x typical is something like product over j to, to x to the cardinal of x of pj to the power npj okay you should have n times p zeros n one minus p ones so this is the generalization to symbols with more than two values okay so this is the probability of a typical realization and then they all have approximately the same probability therefore the number of typical realizations which is the size of this set here this cardinal that want to, that we want to compute times the probability of a typical realization which is this object should be approximately equal to one because all the mass is carried only by typical realizations okay so the number of typical is one over this probability okay and now and this is 2 to the power n times the entropy why because the surprise associated to a typical realization is what is defined as the log let's say 2 1 over this um, this probability and this is you just do the computation with the log you get this n with the log the product become a sum and this is just n times the entropy of x okay and by plugging that here you get that the number of typical realization is 2 to the power n hx okay and therefore the cardinal of this set which is this number if you take 1 over n log 2 which is the delta essential bit content associated to this set it's 1 over n log 2 of the number of typical realization and this is h x okay okay so you have everything there convince yourself it's a beautiful result so from there i don't know how i will do Now we know the entropy is the proper measure of information. Let me define another object, which is called the mutual information between two random variables. It is symmetric and it is the Kullback Leibler divergence between the joint law and the product of marginals which explicitly means integral of d p x y log of p x y over p x p y okay and this you can rewrite it as a difference of entropies in different in in a number of manners but the one that we like the most in this course is that this mutual information is h of y minus h of y given x which is always positive okay because this object is always less than this one 
And what's the interpretation of this? The mutual information is a measure of dependency between the two random variables. Okay. So it's a, it's a measure of uh, how much information you gain about the other when you measure the first one. And indeed, we see it there. Okay. This is the information we gain about y minus the remaining uh, information about y when x was already known. So it's a measure of how the two depend. If x and y are independent, if x and y are independent, then this object is zero. And so the, all, all the information you can gain when measuring the two is just the same as measuring just one. But in an inference setting, this has a very nice interpretation. Let's think about y as the data, again, and x are the parameters we want to infer. This is the total information carried by the data. Okay? And this is the remaining unpredictability about the data when the signal is known. But because the data only depends on the signal and on some noise, this must be the noise contribution. Okay? The only randomness in the data which is not coming from the signal must come from the noise. Does it make sense? Okay. So this is the noise contribution. This is the unpredictability due to the noise. Okay? And so the mutual information between the data and the signal is really the information remaining about the signal only. Because we removed from the total information carried by the data the noise contribution. So what remains is linked to the signal. Is it clear? <laughs> I don't know if it's not clear at all <laughs> or if it is. Does it make sense or just say yeah or no? Okay, cool. So, all that to motivate that from now on my point will be to compute this object. Because if you can compute this object, you know if the data contains information about the signal or not. If this mutual information is high in some sense, it must contain something about the signal. You should be able to infer, okay? While if the noise contribution and this are close to each other, the mutual information should be small, which means that essentially the information on the signal is lost due to the noise. Okay? So this is the crucial object that we want to compute. Yes? Can you explain again why that term represents noise? Because the data, think of this model, for example, the data is signal plus noise. This is the noise, this is the signal. The only randomness in y if you condition on x is coming from the noise. Okay? So, so actually there is There is one special type of uh, models that, will, that is particularly important in all what we'll say. is exactly this model of what we call denoising, which means that you measure, these are your data, your observations. This is some signal-to-noise ratio that controls the strength of the signal times the signal. Now I will emphasize that this is the signal, the ground truth with the star notation plus noise, okay? Where the z, the z i's, where i go from 1 to n, for example, are iid standard Gaussians, okay? And here x star is what you want to reconstruct. So this is called a denoising model. Okay, simple denoising model. In this case, There is a deep relation between the mutual information and the minimum mean square error. 
So I told you, okay, this is a very important object. I motivated all that. But actually, what I said at the beginning is how to define quality of inference through a, an error metric, which was the minimum mean square error. This object is fundamentally linked to the minimum mean square error for this type of models where you have signal plus Gaussian noise, which is the type of models we'll be interested in. Let's say an evolution of this type of model. <coughs> and the relation, which is crucial, is called the IMMS3 relation. I for, this is the mutual uh, information and the MMSC. And it says that if you compute the mutual information between your data and your signal for this model, and you take the derivative with respect to the signal to noise ratio, you will see that as lambda is getting bigger, the noise contribution becomes smaller and smaller. Okay? You have more, the data contains more about the signal. Okay? So it's the signal to noise ratio. So why signal to noise ratio? Because if I take the expectation of uh, one measurement, let's say yi over the strength of the noise, which is its, var its second moment, this gives you lambda. Okay. Lambda times, in this case, rho, where rho is again the second moment of an entry of the signal. So if you take the derivative of this mutual information with respect to the SNR, this tells you exactly the average mean square error. So you can access this observable, this error metric, by just taking a derivative. Like in physics, okay, you have a model, you can compute its free energy for physicists that are in the room. This is nothing else than the free energy in physics. I will show the connection soon. You take the, the derivative of the free energy with, with respect to some control parameter, like the external magnetic field of your model of spins, for example. And what will pop out is the average magnetization of the spin, which is the physical observable that you can measure. Here, what pop out is it's the error of the best algorithm that exists. OK? So. I invite you to look at the proof of this. It's very easy. Okay, uh, takes a, a small page of computation. I, I don't have time to do it, but uh, it's important that you understand this relation. Okay. All right. So I wanted to to do a very small uh, introduction to statistical mechanics. It will, it will be difficult. So, yes. You don't need the parameterization with the square root. It doesn't matter. It's just that we, otherwise I would like I, I would take a derivative with respect to lambda squared, and I prefer to, but it doesn't matter. So keep really in mind this this relation. It's it's absolutely fundamental. When you take for a model of some signal, which can be anything, it can be a scalar, it can be a vector, it can be a ma matrix, this x star, it can be whatever you want. The signal is corrupted by Gaussian noise with IID entries. You compute the mutual information. Okay. If you take the derivative, if you are able to compute this object, that may be difficult. But if you were able to compute it and take a derivative, what you obtain is the optimal error, the minimum mean square error you can aim for. Okay. All right. So, what is statistical mechanics? So now I want to do a link between all that and statistical physics that I will use. And mo mo many techniques that I will present uh, from now on are take root in statistical mechanics. Statistical mechanics is the theory that allows to link the, the, the microscopic behavior of, uh, of uh, entities, okay, that can be atoms in a solid, gas in a liquid, whatever you want, 
to the macroscopic behavior. So it's the theory that links the, the microscopic description to the glo global description at our scale, if you want. Okay, so just some keywords. Uh, more is different. What does it mean? It means that you cannot describe complex systems. So a complex system is a system made of a very large number of interacting entities. You cannot describe this system by just understanding how each entity behaves. Okay? And usually you are not interested in that anyway. And usually this is anyway impossible because the computational power required to do so does not exist. Okay? But anyway, this is not what matters. Okay? You want to describe the, the system at a global level. And at a global level, you really need to take into account the complexity, so really the system as a whole. You cannot describe it by just understanding the, the each, each trajectory of each atom, or in the, in the tasks we are interested in in this course, which are information processing tasks, you are not interested in understanding how each bit is processed by your algorithm. What matters at the end is the global performance of the algorithm, which is described by just one global quantity, which is, for example, this minimum mean square error, okay? Which is, which average the, the performance, like it summarizes all the behavior of the, the complicated processing of each bits, okay? Like in statistical mechanics, we, we describe things at a global scale, okay? In this, in this information processing task. An important notion is emergence. So emergent phenomena. Emergence is when you have things that happen to a complex systems, again, that are really due to the fact that the system is complex. It's some behavior that you would not observe if the system would be uh, composed of few entities interacting. You really need to have a lot, okay? So that this type of phenomena appear. Think of a, a, a bird flock, okay? If you look at few birds together, they look, their behavior is erratic, but then if you have a lot of them, Suddenly you can see, have you seen this, this nice picture where you have global, like a kind of average motion where they move together and all that. So this is an emergent phenomenon. Emergence is linked to a very deep concept, which actually is what we want to understand in this course, in this inference problems, which is the notion of phase transition. A phase transition is the, uh, uh, the maybe the canonical emergent phenomenon. Phase transition is when you have a complex system that you perturb, okay, you change some external parameter of this system, for example, the temperature of some material. Okay, as an experimentalist, you can play with the temperature. And suddenly, at a certain point, the system experiences a sudden change. Okay, it goes from liquid to solid, for example. Okay? So you change some control parameter and you see observables changing. So you see the system suddenly behaves totally differently. And this happens exactly at what we call a phase transition point. And we'll be interested in understanding phase transitions of this kind of objects. We'll see that when the data is too noisy, this object will be very high. We cannot reconstruct the signal. But if we lower the noise, at some point there will be a phase transition and this object will suddenly be small. It's the same type of phenomenon. Okay. All right. So, the type of the type of probability distributions that we are interested in in studying in statistical mechanics, at least in equilibrium statistical mechanics, at this, are of this form. So, assume that you have some complex system which is described by this random variable which is made of n components okay they are not iid this time they are just n components of some vector that belong to some configuration space xn and uh, that have some probability so this is the probability distribution of this random variable equilibrium statistical mechanics is interested in studying complex systems which are described by a 
certain type of probability distribution, which are actually very generic, which are called Gibbs-Boltzmann distributions. which looks like this. The probability that your random variable takes value xn. Maybe this distribution be, be, depends on some parameters. So I used this notation that, that I used from the beginning for data, not uh, I use it uh, on purpose. But at the moment, it's just some parameters on which depends this distribution. It is of the form exponential minus beta some function h of x and maybe that depends on these parameters over what we call z which is the partition function which is the normalization constant of this distribution. Okay? This is called an Hamiltonian. Have you ever heard about Hamiltonians? I see noise. Yes. Okay. The Hamiltonian is the energy function of the system. Okay. It defines the system, if you want. Okay. It defines the way the entities, which are the components of this vector, if you want, think of spins in some in some magnetic material. This would be all the spins. You have n of them, and this is this is the energy function of the system. Okay. This is the partition function. And beta is called the inverse temperature. And physically, it's really related to, to the temperature. Essentially, it allows to tune the randomness in the system. So you see that when beta is going to infinity, which means that the temperature goes to zero or equivalently beta which is one over the temperature goes to zero this measure concentrates onto the configurations with lowest energy with the lowest Hamiltonian you see okay only configurations which which are argmin of this function h they have a non-zero measure. Is it clear? While if beta is going to zero, this becomes the uniform distribution. Okay? So the temperature tunes, if you want, the level of randomness in the system. Okay? So one very important object in, f in, uh, in statistical me mechanics what you are generally interested in computing. So I'm sorry for people that never did StatMeg, I need to go a bit fast. So it's the free energy. So the free energy that in this case might depend on these parameters y, that can be whatever you want, is defined as It's essentially the log partition function divided by n beta with a minus sign. The point is that this object, from this object, you can locate the phase transitions in the model. Okay? Jean, yes. Potential source of a notation uh, confusion. Yeah, you said it, but I want to repeat it. The n that you are using there for the yes. words uh, uh, x is not as little. Uh, it's not the n that you were dealing with before. No, it is. It, it, well, th this xn means that this is a vector made of n components. Yes, but you said these are not uh, independent. No, now they are not independent. This is not. Uh, this has nothing to do with the, what we described when we did source coding. Okay, this is not the same. Yeah, that's what I okay, to say. this is a generic vector with n components that is distributed according to some complex probability distribution which takes this form. Okay? That's all. So, 
if you are able in some way to compute this free energy, and the difficulty is of course to compute this partition function because the partition function is the sum over all possible is the sum over all possible configurations of this object. Then you're done, and we will see why. Essentially, this is your aim. But why is it complicated to compute? You see that this sum, think of the x's, each xi is a bi binary variable, for example. It's a spin, up or down. Then here you have two to the n configurations, okay? So it's this type of configuration space in statistical mechanics, they always grow, the number of, of, um, of possible configurations grows exponentially with the number of variables. So quickly you have no way to compute this sum. Okay? If this H does not verify some decomposition property or whatever, if it's not factorized, this, this exponential, then you have no way to compute this sum. Okay? But in certain types of models that we call mean field models, which are related to these high dimensional inference problems, you are able to do so. And this is what I want to show you. Okay? So, this free energy is like the mutual information, and I will show you that they are connected. If you take derivatives of this object with respect, for example, to the magnetic field in a system of spins, what you will get is the average magnetization, which, is, which quantifies how the system behaves. Okay? So this free energy, it is a nice object in the sense that for properly defined models, it is self-averaging and it has a limit, which means essentially that if I take the expectation with respect to these parameters, whatever they are, whatever they are This goes to zero. What is f is the limit when n goes to infinity of the expectation respect to y of f n y. So this is a well-behaved object. It has a limit. We call it the thermodynamic limit when the number of variables goes to infinity. And it concentrates onto its mean. And this justifies what we call an ensemble analysis, which means that your aim at the end is not really to compute this free energy for a particular realization of the parameters in the problem, but you only need to compute the expectation and the limit. And hopefully this object should be easier to compute. And at the end it's the same. Okay? And this is what we mean by ensemble. By ensemble, we mean that we average over all possible realizations of the parameters in the problem. Okay? So for people that know a bit about spin glass, these parameters could represent the disordered interactions between the spin. Okay? All right, so I think I only have time to define So I want to do two things. I want to link statistical mechanics to inference and then to define the model that will occupy all the rest of the lecture. So, from the base formula, we've seen that a posterior distribution can be written like this. It's a prior times the likelihood over the evidence, okay? But let me just call the Hamiltonian, the energy function of my system that might depend on the data y minus log p of x minus log p of y given x. This is called the log likelihood. In statistics, you hear about that a lot. 
And if I just rename this Z of Y, then I have a statistical mechanics model described by this type of Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution. Okay. So, okay, I did nothing. I just rewrote the posterior in an exponential form. It doesn't look much. But the point is that from there, you can use a bunch of very powerful methods from statistical mechanics to study the limits in inference problems. Okay? Let me just mention, so the free energy we said, so now I just consider the average free energy. So Fn is by the definition is minus one. So let me just say here it, you have a Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution with temperature one. There is no temperature in this inference problems. Okay. It's fixed by the problem. So let me define the free energy like in statistical mechanics minus 1 over n expectation with respect to the data of log of the partition function, which is the evidence. Okay, and what's that? Here I'm taking an expectation with respect to the data, which means that I need to average with respect to the data, but the evidence is nothing else than the partition function of log and I will take this minus and instead write log 1 over zy and what's that? This is the Shannon entropy of the data. Okay? So if you're a physicist and your goal is to compute the free energy or if you're an information theorist your goal is to compute an entropy, you are actually doing the same thing. Okay? The free energy in physics is the Shannon entropy of the data in these inference problems. Okay? <coughs> Again, what we'll compute is the mutual information because it's a nicer object to work with because we have this IMMSC relation that links it to the minimum in square error. But again, this is nothing else than the Shannon entropy minus the conditional entropy of the data given the signal. And this is the contribution of the noise. The noise is IID. So this is very easy to compute because this is essentially the entropy of a high dimensional Gaussian vector. And because the components are IID, this is just a number easy to compute. And in this case, it's one half log two PE. So the noise contribution is always trivial to compute because of the independence assumption of the noise. What is non-trivial to compute is really the entropy of the data, which is the free energy. Okay? So the model that, we'll, that we will study from A to Z is the following model. The Wigner the way around it's the spiked Wigner model. What's the spike Wigner model? It's a very important model that comes from random matrix theory and that is a simple probabilistic model for one of the most fundamental problems in, in machine learning in, in data processing which is called principal component analysis. So, do you know what is principal component analysis? You have a matrix, okay, and you want to find a low rank representation of this matrix, okay? So, simple model for that is the following. Assume you, have, assume, you have, assume you have a matrix with entries Y, I, J, which is constructed in this way, X, I, star, xj star the 
where the x size star are so here little x means this is one realization of the problem and these are outcomes of a random variables x size star which are iid and distributed according to some prior px okay and the zijs little zijs are iid outcomes of standard gaussians okay so it's a very simple model but very rich as we will see so here you have a, a matrix of data if you want okay which is composed from a rank one matrix okay plus noise okay and your task is to find if I give you this data is to find the low rank so the rank one in this case representation of this data this is, this is what you want to store then on your computer you don't want to store all that you want to denoise this matrix so you want to find this part which is called the spike so spike in random matrix means a rank one perturbation from another matrix this is the noise matrix and here you have a spike so you have a rank one structure hidden there okay makes sense so this is a model this model has tons of applications actually this is probably one of the most studied model in random matrix theory it has been introduced by John Stone so I will put the references in the in the notes for the moment they are not there uh, so one application is sparse PCA sparse principal component analysis where you assume that this prior is for example Bernoulli rho so you have a fraction rho of ones which can be small and the rest are zeros and you want to find this sparse representation of this matrix okay this is called sparse principal component analysis another application in computer science is called submatrix localization where you want to find in this matrix a submatrix with a higher mean okay so think of this as essentially zeros and few ones so there are some entries of this matrix which have a higher mean slightly higher by a factor one over square root of n and all the other entries have a mean equal to zero because this is Gaussian noise and you want to find this hidden matrix okay it's also linked to what we call z2 synchronization Z2 synchronization means that essentially you have pairwise uh, it, it's the case where the prior in this case is you have binary spins essentially so the entries are plus or minus one plus or minus one with equal probability and uh, you want to recover uh, this this spins if you want. Okay, so you can read about these applications uh, which are there. And um, I'm done. So I wanted to do uh, more. Uh, so I will do more next time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right, um, very pleased to introduce the third lecturer, uh, Lars uh, Rutotto from uh, Emory University. Uh, I should make a comment on the fact that uh, all the lecturers so far uh, look like they could be participants. <laughs> and if, if this is a, a testament to, to the fact that this is a young and uh, upcoming uh, field. Uh, 
Uh, so Lars uh, did his studies uh, in Germany, in Münster, and uh, held uh, positions in Lübeck and uh, in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia, where he was a postdoc, and then he was hired by Emory University in Atlanta, which was my former institution uh, until a year ago. So I, I've been a colleague uh, of Lars's for, for a while. Lars uh, works on a variety of topics. Uh, he came from the field of uh, I would say optimization and image uh, processing, uh, especially for uh, image uh, restoration. And uh, then uh, a few years ago, he started a very active research program in, uh, in machine learning. He's uh, received several uh, grants uh, in support of his research from NSF and, and other agencies. So thank you, Lars. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> All right, uh, thanks Michele for this uh, nice introduction. Thanks to all the organizers for having me. Uh, this trip is a huge treat. I've been looking forward uh, to this uh, for a few months now. Uh, I mean, at least as, uh, since I found out that I can uh, teach a course here uh, in this very prestigious place and also in this very nice town with, with actually nice weather too. So I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to be uh, part of the program. Um, my course um, is going to focus on numerical methods for deep learning. Uh, so I will kind of give you maybe some contradicting, but or maybe provocative, or just some other views on, on this uh, deep learning problem that is then what is covered in other talks. But um, um, we'll see it. Uh, we'll see how we go through there. Before I j uh, jump into my slides, um, I want to mention that the slides are available online. Um, I don't have a nice co short URL to write down, so you can see my algorithm for finding the slides. If you go to this website and you type in my name, and either you uh, click on I f I'm feeling yuck lucky or you take the first search result yourself, um, and under teaching you should find the course um, someplace. I guess I'm teaching a lot. Um, uh, down here. So there you see the Scola Normale um, uh, course, uh, you see uh, some, some uh, words and some stuff and uh, here you see all the slides linked. Um, so I've put uh, two sets that I'm not going to go through, I uh, called them uh, part zero. Um, that's you know just a collection of some notation. If you, if you get lost in notation you can look in there. It's basically a document, like a policy document for myself to remind myself what notation I want to be using and uh, maybe I succeed most of the time. Uh, um, and uh, also one set of slides with uh, literature because this is such an emerging and quickly moving field. It's not a complete survey or complete list of, of, of papers, but I, you know, eventually uh, update them uh, as I go through and as, uh, uh, you know, from conference deadline to conference deadline, which happens like every other month or so, of course uh, there should be papers being added there. Um, and um, then you see the three parts um, that we'll go through. So the idea is kind of for today, to talk about linear models, so we, it's, it's even shallower than shallow learning, but uh, I want to kind of make sure that we are all on the same page in this course. Um, I want to show you also a small example um, and, and, uh, and all that. Um, we'll take about uh, a five minute break or so halfway through because it's been a long day for everyone. Um, and uh, also I need a break every now and then. Um, and um, then from tomorrow and uh, up until through Friday, sorry, I did not mean to click on it, but it actually shows that there's a document, um, is a nonlinear models, um, and then we will go to something that I find very exciting. We we'll go actually very deep, we could say infinitely deep, uh, by taking a continuous limit uh, in the number of layers. Um, and we'll see how far we get. Um, uh, probably we'll have uh, maybe some time for a bonus episodes. I mean, I have more material and I will compile it basically uh, based on the feedback and the time that we have available um, in the end. Um, we will look at codes. So that is uh, something new in this course. Um, uh, I'm a big proponent of you know, starting with very simple examples uh, that you code yourself rather than jumping right onto the tensor TensorFlow PyTorch train and, uh, and take off. So uh, we have a lot of material for that. I will mainly comment uh, two packages uh, that are both available here and linked here. Uh, this is the easy code. Um, 
I call it the uh, NumDL MATLAB code. Um, that is like really as basic as it can be. Um, MATLAB code uh, that you could write down um, to train some deep neural networks yourself. Um, and then we also have some more fancy, uh, more versatile toolboxes, but those need a little bit more concepts like object-oriented programming and stuff like that. I wouldn't uh, expect uh, uh, that uh, from everyone. So the, the MATLAB code is really like more straightforward. So I'll show some examples, and all the examples I show you can find in those packages. And sometimes I even put them on like the file name on the slides. So. Uh, there is that, and I highly encourage to look at this. So in the lecture time, we won't have too much time to play with the code, but the code is is there, and is uh, hopefully like for some of you who consider getting started in this business, or maybe have some idea they quickly want to uh, find out if it works or not, uh, that uh, could actually be some valuable resource. Um, okay, so then uh, let's uh, look into the slides and also give you a little bit more of, a, of an overview about um, what, what I'm going to uh, tackle here. Uh, so first I will you know, give a brief introduction. I mean we have already seen some introduction to machine learning but I want to give you my, my view on it as well just so that you can uh, compare or maybe even review something uh, from, from a few hours ago. And then I will talk about linear models and there I have uh, two things uh, um, that I want to talk about. The first one is least squares. So it's basically regression, um, a very, uh, very mature machine learning technology. And the other one would be logistic regression. So this one is when you want to fit real value data. The other one is if you want to do classification, which are basically my, uh, the two application areas that we, want to, uh, that we are going to cover in this mini course. Um, and then part two, um, we will see, so we will see that linear models are great, but they will not be able to do everything that we want them to do. So the idea is then uh, how, how do we uh, kind of move forward and one mo way to move forward that is attractive these days is neural networks. So I will introduce them and uh, there we'll go shallow to deep. So first we will uh, have uh, just single layer neural networks. I'll talk a little bit convol about convolutional neural networks, but I also want to keep this ra rather general to cover more than just convolutions and to something like parametric models. Um, and uh, then we will actually get our hands dirty here with the training a single layer neural network. Um, and um, that is, uh, as we saw actually in the, in, in the talk right now, that is a, a somewhat of a big leap. I mean, you know, once we go in here, so up until here everything is going to be nice and convex. And then things uh, start getting non-convex. Um, I know convexity is a boolean, either you are convex or not, you're not convex. Some people say it's highly convex, whatever that means. So single layer neural networks are not, let's say they are not so non-convex. We can uh, do some experiments. Um, and then we will go deeper. Uh, so we will go to uh, like neural networks with more than uh, one layer. Um, they're called then deep neural networks, uh, which is uh, of course very attractive these days. Um, and particularly about residual neural networks, because those then, those ones will really be the basis and the foundation of part three. Um, that is then linking those networks to differential equations, uh, either ODEs or even PDEs. Um, so that's of course the area that I'm uh, most excited about these days um, and uh, I could probably talk all week about just that. It would be an easy sell I think in this room, um, uh, but uh, I want to make sure that we actually have uh, the right basis uh, when, once we get there. Um, and also kind of build, uh, talk about all the experiences that you have to collect on your way because uh, one way to look at this and that certainly we fell for it back then so we basically started from here saying okay resonance are like ODEs we've been dealing with ODEs all our lives how hard can this be to compete with Google and uh, we were very enthusiastic for a couple of weeks uh, and then we realized there's more to it and uh, that is basically the first part of the, or the first two parts of the course so I'll walk you through all that Okay, um, so let's um, see if this one works or not. Anyway, let's move here. So let's do uh, machine learning in three slides. Okay, so first thing is uh, you pull up Wikipedia and you see what is actually a definition of machine learning because there's actually a lot of vocabulary that is uh, mixed around. So there's artificial intelligence, there's machine learning, all these different things are, uh, they're not synony synonyms. Uh, we are only gonna talk about machine learning which is a subset of AI. Um, and it's basically the study of algorithms and statistical models um, that you can use to perform a task without explicit instructions. So you, you rely on patterns and inference 
instead of, you know, um, if uh, this thing has... Uh, but to in, uh, infer that from seeing many examples. Um, so that's the definition of, of ML that we're going to talk about here. Um, there are probably more than two uh, tasks in, in ML, but I tried to roughly divide things into um, unsupervised learning. So there you're given some data and you are asked to cluster it, find some interesting patterns. And uh, basically it's, it's an explorative uh, task that you have in here. Um, and the other one would be um, supervised learning. So there you have uh, data and you have labels. So you know basically inputs and outputs to a function and you want to, uh, to identify that functional relationship bit between, uh, what, between the data set that you are given. So that's supervised. Um, and in the middle there is semi-supervised learning. So um, here is just uh, uh, slide number two uh, of, of the ML introduction. We have uh, unsupervised learning. So think about uh, you have a two-dimensional feature space and um, you will see actually quite quite many of those examples that are uh, that are happening in two-dimensional space because there I can plot everything and by everything I mean everything so we w we're going to look at hidden layers which uh, some people are not uh, uh, supposed to look at but we will actually in, in two dimensions you know we can uh, plot every every little step and that's very valuable I think especially when you get started in, in this in this business um, so your feature Y here is basically a collection um, of, um, of uh, vectors that live in uh, 2D space. You have N of those. Um, and uh, think about just loading those and uh, looking at the numbers in the command line. That will not tell you anything. But once you plot these as an image, you see that your data set uh, is comprised of, say, three clusters. And I think, uh, actually, it's an interesting question how you would want to break them down. But uh, most people would think that they, these are concentric circles and you would uh, label them uh, by, by, by the radius or something like that. However, I mean, think about teaching a computer to do this just by reading the numbers in. It's not, it's not that easy. Um, uh, so that is, um, that is an unsupervised setting. In semi-supervised uh, learning, uh, think about you label three points in each of those clusters. And I don't know if, 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 if they are big enough, so I put some yellow dots here, some red dots here, and some blue dots in there. So those would then be kind of a, the scenario you have a lot, uh, you have a large data set, and someone went in and uh, took a few examples and assigned a label, which is you know, one label that you want to keep, and you want to fill in the other information. So based on those like nine labels that you've gotten, um, you want to label say this, this black point over here. Um, a related problem um, that, that uh, maybe some, some people here in the room know in uh, PDE image processing um, would be image in painting. Image in painting you can also call a semi-supervised learning problem. Um, who has uh, heard of image in painting? Okay, so quite a, quite a few actually. If you do, if you have not uh, image in painting, you know, I give you an image, but part of the image is say occluded or destroyed or something like that, and you want to find out uh, basically what is the meaningful way to assign intensities to those pixels. Semi supervised learning, where the labels are the pixel values that you are given, um, and the features are basically the x y positions. Okay. Um, so just to make make that connection too. Um, so if you if you are in unsupervised settings, you basically um, have a very uh, explorative and open-ended question that you are asking. So you're not really asking uh, what is the relation and what is the mapping from x and y or x1 and x2 uh, to the label. What you're asking is only okay. So I have all these bunch of examples. I know these three are blue, what, what does that mean now for, for this location um, uh, y, y10, which is your 10th example? Uh, that, is, uh, that is here the, the question. Um, and um, yeah, again, semi-supervised is right in the middle uh, then between that. So what is supervised uh, machine learning? So this, you could have the, f the following example. Um, I give you, again, a two-dimensional feature space. Um, and I have uh, five different colors in this picture. Okay, so every point that I have, so every every point has a label, and the label is encoded by the color. Um, 
And now what I ask you to do is to find a function, f we call it, that maps you from the y space to the c space. So um, since we do a lot of classification examples, c are going to be my labels and y are going to be my inputs. Um, so here you are actually asked to get this function, to model that function. And once you have the function, you can uh, generate a picture like so. Something with a mic? Well, we are good. Okay. Just making sure everything is all right here. Um, okay, so once you have solved the supervised classification problem or supervised learning problem, what you have is your result is going to be that f. And you can generate a picture like so, where you can see basically the output of f being, print, being plotted as if, if it was an image. So think about how you would generate this picture. You would um, make a grid of um, in the, along the first coordinate dimension and the second coordinate dimension. Okay. You would put in all these 2D points into your F. You would get uh, one of five colors. And so then you call whatever image function you have uh, to, to, pro, uh, to uh, make, make an image like that. And then I superimposed also the training data here, uh, which uh, is just to guide, you, guide your eye a little bit to see that this is an okay result. I think uh, we did an okay job here. Do I want to move it further up or? The receiver? Yes. Okay. Okay, questions so far? <laughs> Would be a good time, actually a great time. Okay, uh, let's see how that goes. Um, okay, so the, the first key question that you want to answer here is what, what f am I looking for? Okay, um, there are different ways to do this. Um, the, so f we will call also a model and the choice of models range drastically in complexity. So you could start uh, with a linear model, which in this case will probably not uh, get the job done. Uh, then you could uh, think about being smart uh, to say, you know, maybe I can, uh, I mean, in the previous example it was ver very obvious what would be a good uh, feature that you could extract from your input data. That could be, for example, the radius or so. Here it's maybe not so obvious what, what you would want to do. Um, you could uh, look into uh, support vector machines or kernel methods, which have been incredibly popular in machine learning. Um, but uh, recently, the, the most promising tool would be a deep neural network. Um, and that's the route that I'm going to take. So I'm not going to talk about SVMs and kernel methods uh, so much. Uh, I already met a few people who work on those. Uh, so we have some local experts here. Um, so that's, that's good. But we will focus on the, on the deep neural networks. But um, in my interpretations, I will oftentimes refer to those good old machine learning models as well, um, just to make some connections here. Um, OK, so that's machine learning in three slides. Uh, hopefully that was not so so bad. So I want to also take take a few steps back, uh, maybe compared to uh, what we've already seen, to make the point that you know learning from data is not new. Um, so guess for example uh, the following example, and I think uh, it has, there's a local relationship here. Yeah. Um, so. It was on the slides before though too, so uh, I didn't just want to please Michele. But, um, so learning from, from data is, is really not new. Um, and there, there are many ways to, for example, build a good model F here. And uh, the, the first option, and I think it's the option, I mean, at least I grew up in, because I'm relatively new to machine learning, and I've worked a lot on PDE-based image processing or even PDE-based imaging, uh, is that you, at least think that you have some fundamental understanding. So I put this question mark here. And you could, for example, think that, uh, that uh, x of t is 1 half g of t, uh, t squared, something like that. Um, so that's uh, Newton's formula, OK? Um, the only problem is that you have this parameter g. Who knows what it stands for? Um, so how do you find g in, in this uh, nice model? Um, you uh, could, for example, find a tower and you could drop certain things and uh, you could measure at each, uh, you need a good measurement device but you could measure kind of uh, what is the height or so um, at, at a few time points t. 
Now you have some data that you could use to calibrate the model. Okay, so that's um, that. That I don't know. It's not considered machine learning these days. Maybe back in the day uh, it was uh, also a similar level of hype. But uh, this is uh, I would not consider it it it, it, it machine learning uh, because here think about the definition that we had. Um, you are not just extracting patterns from data because you start with a model and you start th this model did not come out of thin air so you it comes from some fundamental laws um, and only parts of the models are unknown um, okay o however there are also other tasks where you may not be so lucky to to be able to de derive some theory so that's called uh, phenomeno phenomenological models so one example here is um, something called Archie's Law. So during my postdoc I was in, in the department of geophysics or earth and ocean sciences and uh, there a question is so what's the electrical resistivity of a rock um, and especially particularly how it relates to some properties of that rock for example porosity and saturation. So there is not so clear what is the right model. There are certain rules that you just don't want to violate uh, but in the node space basically of those, those rules, you can uh, basically make up a model um, as long as it matches your, your experimental results. And one way to do this is then to, to kind of come up with uh, some, uh, some ideas where you know, the porosity kind of gets scaled with some uh, exponent n over 2 um, and, um, uh, and the saturation uh, has another power of p here attached to it and those parameters uh, a, n and p would then be dependent on the, on the specific rock that you have and you do run a lot of material, uh, material science experiments to, to generate those, put them in a table and, and there you have it. Uh, but the difference here is that uh, this model is more or less derived also sometimes from observations by just looking at how things uh, relate um, and it's chosen so that it does not really violate, so it's consistent with fundamental theory but not directly derived from it. Um, so it's a, like um, when these examples can probably even be much more extreme if you now think about uh, deriving a, a model that classifies as was proposed uh, cats and dogs. Okay, so there is probably no fundamental law that uh, we can phrase in, in, in mathematical terms uh, very easily um, to, to describe that process. So there is really phenomenological and that's kind of the core of what we're going to talk uh, in, in here. Um, so what are the, uh, the benefits and risks? Uh, so if you have a fundamental law and you got it right, then you can assume that it's uh, somewhat invariant so you can uh, even predict it so if you just dropped uh, I don't know a tennis ball from your tower um, and if you drop a b bowling uh, ball tomorrow I mean you will have a rough feeling of how things will you can make a prediction and the prediction will be very accurate how, how, how fast that's, that's going to fall um, where, whereas on the other hand if you train a neural network say um, to classify cat and dog images and tomorrow you're interested in uh, classifying different kind of fish you probably will not be that lucky. You may have to re-derive the, the whole model uh, which means maybe the parameters but also maybe the whole neural network is not adequate for, for getting that job done. Um, okay, so, and also if you have the model it's sometimes hard to know what the limitations are. Because if you can write down very, very nicely like a Newton's formula, then you know kind of what, what, what you get. Uh, whereas with a neural network, things we will find out become a little bit more messy. Or actually a lot more messy. Um, so the model will, will be hard to interpret. Um, and yeah, if you have a model that is uh, based on, uh, on your understanding, it can still fail. Um, so for example, weather prediction has improved dramatically actually over the last uh, few decades, but still there, there are certain things that it cannot do. And sometimes there are even some errors in, the, in those predictions. And economics, I think, uh, will also be one, one word of warning where people think they have fundamental laws that uh, can price everything, but sometimes even we, we realize that it's not always accurate. Um, and sometimes, and increasingly, there's many more examples these days, um, models that are trained on data can sometimes do better. Um, and uh, one question that you also have here, um, and I want to put that out, uh, is how you actually quantify that. So how do you quantify understanding? Or how do you quantify that your network has learned? That is very, very difficult because you just know that it is good at mimicking uh, whatever examples that you throw at it. 
uh, it's not really uh, clear like why for example a, a certain prediction was made um, these are very hard uh, problems that uh, um, I think interesting research is being done uh, on, on those ones okay so so then what is deep learning um, so first of all also just to say that um, deep so deep learning is basically when you take a neural network and you use what's called a deep architecture so um, an architecture basically is a given instance of a neural network and deep you know we can now argue but let's say more than one layer um, okay um, and uh, the deeper you get um, the more the hope is to become more expressive uh, but the fear is that these things are more, more difficult to deal with especially numerically which again will be our focus um, neural networks are not new there have been summers and winters and um, they've been around at least since the 70s uh, some some things uh, some works go even back way earlier um, However, recently they have, a new, have received a new summer, um, mainly due to two effects. So one is computational power. So there was the invention of the GPU and uh, some people actually making it uh, amenable for computations, which has drastically changed uh, our field of uh, computer science and engineering. Um, and uh, rich data sets that have been collected. And uh, I, I listened to podcasts quite a lot, and there was a scary statistic, I hope I got this right, because it was cooking at the, at the same time, like 80% of the data that we have was created in the last two years, or some shocking number like that. Um, so um, probably this will be, and, co and computers you know, also keep improving. So um, there will be probably ma many more uh, applications for data-driven modeling. Um, the observation so far is that they can perform very well when they're trained with lots of data. Um, and uh, some applications that are actually quite advanced is image recognition, segmentation, natural language processing. So for someone who did a PhD in, Im in image processing with, without data-driven modeling, that can be actually quite scary because uh, for some tasks these, these networks actually perform uh, way better than the you know, mathematically much more beautiful models that, uh, that, uh, that we have in, the, in that field. And uh, also I should say there are some connections where people are using Part in like neural networks that are inspired by those mathematical models and th those ones are actually very interesting so I put a few uh, references in here uh, then uh, of course you know I should update this one uh, they're not so recent news articles uh, so if, if people are still wondering why they came to this workshop um, of course because data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century uh, before it used to be mathematician um, now but, the, but the, good, the good news is actually you can be a mathematician and work in data science so that is uh, I think the best of both worlds um, okay and now is the question why we are actually here. So that is an article that I really recommend reading if you have not had a chance. It made a big wave. Um, no one really knows how the most advanced algorithms do what they do. That could be a problem. And um, I would certainly agree with that statement. Uh, so it's uh, from MIT Technology Review. Uh, it's a very nice article. Um, and, uh, but also, I mean, it's, it's easy to say, okay, that could be a problem. But let's work together on ways how to fix this. So how, how we can, uh, how we can uh, do this, I think mathematics will have uh, quite, quite a say in it. And I want to kind of use the course to give you some first pointers to get started in this business and bring a little bit of, um, of um, order into this jungle of machine learning. Um, so we will look definitely under the hood of deep learning tools. I mean, that's also what, what, I, what I do in my daily life. Um, and uh, mostly describe deep learning mathematically, um, expose some numerical challenges, and also improve uh, or also approaches that can actually improve deep learning. So we will not take the view of just an adversary who tries to bash what the people in machine learning are doing because they actually have done uh, quite an amazing job in making things work. Like if you think, for exa example, about Siri. Siri works pretty well these days and it's one example where there is uh, not uh, like a code written on how to, p how to interpret language but it's a trained model. Um, okay, so um, we have to give uh, credits actually to, to the people who, who were in machine learning but it still doesn't mean that uh, you know with more mathematical understanding we couldn't do better. 
So um, that's at least one of the beliefs I have. Okay, so that's a, these are basically the three learning objectives. Like if you come out of this course and you say, okay, I saw that there are still some problems in machine learning, but they are actually interesting. I know how to phrase them as a math problem. And now I can go home and write a paper about it. I want to see that paper. So you can send it to me then. Um, uh, because I, I want to see more mathematicians uh, embarking on this. Um, okay, so if you look at uh, deep neural networks, then they typically look like so. Um, maybe also a, a good uh, referendum here. Like who, who is familiar with looking at these pictures and knows exactly what's going on there? Oh wow, almost everyone. Who is not familiar with those images and has maybe a little bit shaky of what's going on? Great, this picture is for you then, or this slide is for you, Alex. So, uh, because in this talk what we will not do is we will not talk about these pictures. So that will be the last picture of this kind. Uh, because, as especially um, in, the, in the very beginning, I was uh, confused. Probably the first three months I figured out what this, what this picture actually means. Because uh, you have uh, these, these circles, so these circles are features. Um, in this case, think about uh, having three input features and one output features. And uh, then you have red layers here, uh, that's the input. You have blue layers, which are the so-called hidden layers. Um, and you have uh, this, this greenish uh, guy in the end, which is the output. Um, and these arrows here mean that basically this feature here is computed by considering this one, this one, and this one. So when there's an arrow, it means that this information kind of is somehow accounted, um, and, and so on. So you see uh, basically arrows all over the place. Everyone talks to everyone, but it's what is called a feed-forward network. So there the arrows only point from left to right. Okay, so in, in the language where I come from, we can en encode all that information and even more if we write down something like you have a feature vector YL you multiply it with a matrix KL this matrix KL is a dense matrix it has uh, in the first layer say it's a 4 by 3 matrix and it has entries all over the place which means that there are arrows all over the place um, you add a vector BL which stands for the bias and then you apply an activation function. So that is a function, uh, we saw a few examples earlier, that are point-wise, non-linear function. Think about something easy, like, uh, like dropping all the negative numbers or something like that. Um, so this uh, notation here captures all the information of this picture and even more. For example, that the relation that you're looking for here is an affine transformation of this data, um, where I should say the KL and the BLL are not known. So these are the weights of your neural network, the, or parameters, uh, I will call them sometimes, uh, that you want to learn. Uh, and what will be the learning objective uh, for, for, for learning, we will see in a bit. Um, and the si so the sigma will be given, and you will basically know the size and the sparsity pattern of, of all the operators k. Um, the k will vary, of course, by size in the, in the different layers. So the first one will be a 4 by 3 matrix, then this one will be a 4x4 four four matrix, and this one will be a 1x4 uh, matrix. Okay, so this is the architecture, if you will. Now that you know that trick, you could also say, what, what do I need to change if I want to make this layer, we call it wider? Um, then basically I add a few more rows into my matrix, and then just so that my code doesn't crash, I also need a, a few more columns in the matrix associated with, the with that layer. So that's basically, uh, you know, the first um, way to, to, um, to describe mathematically how, how we do this. This process is called forward propagation. Because again, we will consider feed-forward networks. Uh, we start with an input feature and we go through. And uh, so this is a, what's called a, a single layer perceptron model. Very, very ancient model. Uh, over the last uh, couple of, of years, you know, and, uh, and cent uh, decades, uh, a few others have been added. So we will talk a lot about a model like so and a model like so. Um, so there are so some differences. So for example, here the only change is that I added a wide L plus, okay, for whatever reason. I mean, one, one thing you realize very quickly when you are in deep learning is there are no rules. The only rule is that you need to be better than the competitors, okay? Um, 
and uh, so why not add this um, and then of course you know you would say okay um, now basically I have uh, Y L plus and then a single layer perceptron what happens if I have two of these guys sure why not um, so and then you know the list goes on I mean you can basically write down whatever you like and I will actually I mean, this now is, is nice but it's also scary because now I mean how can you decide before investing uh, 500 GPU hours um, if this model is actually meaningful or not meaningful so we saw some plots of objective functions so my philosophy is I want to make choices and I want to make my life simple so that I maybe don't have so many local minima okay um, that's of course a big mission but I will show you a few examples where where you can actually do that um, so and again, I mean, these are basically whatever I, I talked through, so just uh, the notation uh, to set that right. Um, and I, I think I, saw th I, I said that, but uh, I can repeat that. So if whenever you have a question, just you know, uh, ask for the microphone and ask the question. I mean, like, I don't want anyone to hold back or so. You have a question? No? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, good. Anyway, okay, so. Um, okay, so the way at least when you come from numerical analysis uh, one way I want you to think about a neural network is to be an interpolator or a classifier so an interpolator in semi-supervised learning is, is basically probably the most natural um, na natural uh, analogy here so you're given some data and you want to kind of uh, interpolate or extrapolate um, and we know one is easier than the other so that will be the same thing for neural networks uh, we'll write these as uh, f again that maps the input feature y depends on so theta here theta will be our joker so you saw on the previous slide you saw k's and l's and b's everything gets lumped into theta in, uh, in a certain order um, some software packages will even not give you the or will not even have a theta floating around uh, that is really scary freaks me out but uh, um, the, the, actually that's the way it, uh, most of the big packages are coded so you optimize something and you don't see it uh, not so much in our codes uh, we try to have this guy uh, close to our chest in some sense um, so nf will be the dimension of the input data um, again we, input data can be more as anything I'll show you a few examples uh, but think about say an image that you just vectorize into a, a long vector um, C will be uh, the uh, the output and that could be the class of the image um, We will see how we encode that um, Because I really want to be down to the, to the nitty-gritty details to show you give you at least the, the feeling and with the code Actually the ability to run some of these things yourself and the theta again will be all the parameters and in supervised learning Which is mainly what we will be talking about um, you have a data set consisting of n of those examples and you want to learn or estimate those parameters theta that's uh, that's uh, what it means to do deep learning um, and the tools to do this estimation will be mainly numerical optimization um, I don't have uh, too much about statistical inference but many of these statistical inference problems as we saw this morning boil down to doing some optimization and um, so I will we'll be talking about that mostly. So here's the, the most classical example that you will see is uh, you want to classify handwritten digits. So think you're you, the US Post or something like that. And you want to uh, deliver some letters or your bank that needs to ca uh, cash some checks. Um, then you want to find out what is, uh, what is in this picture. That's the Y1 and this is the Y2, two different examples. And so here I, I hope I got that right, but because counting is not really my, my greatest strength. So, so think about this being the label C1. So it's a vector, should have about 10 entries, and uh, has numbers between 0 and 1 in there, and they should sum to 1, so this one worked out. Um, and there is an, a 1 here in the, what is it, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th entry. So I guess the idea is to start counting with 0. So the way to read this is so with zero percent probability do I predict that that is a zero okay and then you keep going um, and the fifth one which will be a four gets a hundred percent probability so here we are absolutely certain that that is a four okay um, in machine learning what you will mostly see when you when you get started is because people want to save bits as much as possible um, that you are basically given, so C1 would just be uh, the number 4 
which seems to be a much, much more efficient way to encode that information. It's called a one-hot encoding, if you ever open one of these document, documentations. Um, I personally don't really like that too much, because there are also images like this one. So if I ask the whole room what is in this image, then I think 30% will say it's a 1, and the other 70% will say it's a 7. Okay? So with one-hot encoding, what do you do now? Because you have to realize that those labels, they're not ordered in any particular way. Okay, so you cannot say it's like a, what, what would that be, like one, seven, uh, you average it, you would get a four. Okay, that's, a, that's clearly a bad idea, right? So um, think about those, uh, those labels in classification being vectors from the unit simplex. That's really what they are, or like a discrete probability. Um, and so the output of your network, of your model F, somewhat has to have entries that are that unit simplex. Okay, so that will be one thing that we need to ensure. Um, you can do the same thing in color also. So, but not, but please, not too many pixels. At least if you use uh, the, the MATLAB's codes that we have. And what is that? Um, let's actually switch that off. Okay, um, sorry about that. So you can do this also with images. So we have some examples for this uh, CIFAR 10 image where you want to find boats and cars and some fun stuff. Um, a related but actually very different problem is segmentation. So think about um, you are given, um, so each YJ is an RGB image, say from a camera that is mounted on a car. Um, and you see some street scenes um, in the inputs and your job is to do a segmentation. So why could that be useful? So if you heard about uh, something called a self-driving car, um, that would be very useful if there was a camera that would say, okay, so there's a car in front of me, there's a car here, there's a truck or a bus here. Um, that's, a, that's a sidewalk, please don't go there. And by the way, that's the road. So that would be extremely useful um, for, for, um, for those technologies. So in here though, um, basically, the labels, you would have to have one label per pixel. So each pixel in the image you want to say which class it goes into. Um, so it's a classification problem, okay, but it's not just uh, you know one classification problem per pixel because uh, typically you will have some relations between different uh, uh, different pixels. So, for example, all the work on on segmentation with PDEs is based on PDE operators that do some some smoothing locally. Okay. Uh, so, if you if you want to do semantic segmentation, then better you kind of uh, build networks that that exchange local information um, and hopefully quite efficiently because. Here a big challenge is you're given a high dimensional input and you are asked for a high dimensional output. So that is way less forgiving in our experience than if I give you a high dimensional image and I ask you is it a cat or a dog or is it a one or a four where basically you all, all you need is to estimate uh, like a small vector. Okay, so, um, so these problems are incredibly hard to solve uh, but interesting. Uh, because of that they're interesting. Um, yeah, so, so in here there are different ways to go about it. Um, so one idea is you could extract some features. So you are given the image um, and uh, you extract some features, like you could think about uh, locality or think about at each pixel we sample a little bit of a patch or something like that. And uh, there are various ideas how you, how you can, can do this and to, to reduce it basically to classification problems. And of course you can also do PDE based models. Um, and if we have time on Friday, I, I can show you some recent work that we have done in that area. Um, okay. Uh, of course, you know, you, you could also go into, like, have neighborhoods and edges, and all these informations are probably going to be useful. Um, okay, so I talked about you have this model F that you want to calibrate. You have inputs, you have outputs. So off you go, get, get theta and, 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 uh, and probably by minimizing something, that something we'll have to see how, how much it makes sense or not makes sense. Uh, but we should acknowledge, and you have to stop me on this if I get carried away by numerical optimization, um, learning is not an optimization problem. I have to remind myself every morning when I go to work. The actual problem is generalization. Okay? So what do we mean by that really? 
So think you have the, so these are our examples, n of them that we have used to train the model. We've done a perfect job on this. Uh, you've minimized the objective function with the Newton's method. Uh, gradient is zero, Hessian is positive, definite. You think you're done. But then comes someone along and gives you these test images. So y, yjt and cjt. Um, and those ones were not included in your training data. Okay. Um, and then the idea is, you know, you plug those guys in and uh, if yjt, uh, when, when you plug it into f equals cjt, you've done a good job. We call it you generalize. So uh, there are different ways now to go about this, but maybe loosely speaking, what you can say is if the distance between, in some p norm, you can pick whatever you want. Uh, if, if the distance here is, is small, then the model is, is predictive, at least, I mean, now we have to acknowledge, predictive at least on the testing set. And uh, you have to see that your testing set is, is rich enough. Um, and uh, then you can say that your model generalizes well, okay? And that is the actual goal um, that, that we, are, we are having here in, in machine learning, okay? Um, and especially for, um, for data-driven models, there's no reason a priori why they should generalize. Again, this is different to fundamental laws, um, okay? So, okay, so think about the scenario where you find out that for the test data your model does poorly okay so basically whatever you tried it didn't work okay i've been there so there are a few reasons wh uh, what could have happened and i want to actually borrow an example from the previous talk also uh, so think about you are training your model on these blue points and your validation or your test point is this red guy so you missed it and uh, basically this uh, phenomenon here we would say th so the theta it was optimal for the training data but is le is less optimal for for the test data so now of course you know had you added this point to your test data you would have done a perfect job okay um, that's one of the reasons it's uh, very common especially when you um, when you try to follow this uh, these, uh, train of thought to make a neural network and make it really, really, really big and powerful, um, you may be caught in that trap. The other um, thing that could happen, and that also sometimes occurs in practice, is um, you are, your model F is just not rich enough. Okay, so think about in this case, all you need, all you have here is a quadratic model. Okay, um, and you fit, fit it through here, and you do, um, you do even worse, uh, no, no, you do actually a little bit better on, the, on this red dot. So that could also happen. Um, so now, okay, let's, come, let's go down to practice. So what do I do to find out which regime I'm in? So that's something uh, every, every one of my students has to, has to do when, when I see a model. Um, in this case, it's actually easy. So you show me the residuals <coughs> of your training data. So you see, show me the loss value. The loss is here zero. So zero loss on the training, large loss on the validation. That means overfitting. Okay? In here, um, very small uh, or a very large loss on the training and approximately equally large loss on the validation. So that means you know, basically like underfitting. I don't, I don't know that's a, that's a term in machine learning. But if you, if you are here, I want to make you uh, well, want to m want you to think about making the model bigger or richer, um, or try less hard in the optimization. To be honest, because that's also something we've heard. Maybe the Newton's method was not a great idea. Maybe you want to do something like SGD, which is a very very s painfully slow method, but uh, sometimes slow is good. Um, if you are in this regime, uh, sorry, this was a, if you if you are in this regime here. Uh, you want to use less uh, less powerful optimization or a smaller model. Here, bigger model or better optimization. Sorry, I got, think I got that wrong. Hopefully, I didn't confuse too many people. Good. Um, okay. So, so let's talk about linear models. Linear models um, is um, um, the the first thing to to start with, and. Um, we can, yeah, why don't I just introduce a model and then we'll see if we find a good break point for a break. Or do you want to take a break right now? Because it's a kind of, uh, 
Okay, if it's up to me, then probably I would call a break now because then I don't uh, introduce one thing, have a break, and nobody uh, knows what we've talked about, okay? So, f but you promised me to be back in five minutes, okay? Good. Uh, so that's me, uh, 4.55 4 that is. Okay, so now everyone is back. So I actually have to go a little bit a few slides back um, and I have to say like everyone in the audience passed the test. So that is a test of politeness um, because I thought if I go to Pisa and I credit this thing to the wrong guy, let's see what the, what the crowd will think. Um, so of course, you know, as Michaela gladly, uh, politely pointed out, um, this is Galileo's law and uh, you know, Newton is just a differential equation you derive from it. And he, apparently the history is actually uh, much nicer than sometimes these days where Newton attributed that also to Galileo. Okay, um, so sorry about that. I'll, I'll correct that, of course. And, uh, but, and again, you guys did very good on this uh, test, and almost too good because I was not interrupted at all in the first part of the of the class. I hope that'll change, or well, I'm sure it'll change. Um, okay, so, but everything else was completely correct, <laughs> except for one typo that uh, Rosa you know, noticed. Um, okay, so linear models um, are really the simplest. Uh, thing but also for some people still interesting enough I think to talk about or, or now I mean I, may, I make it interesting enough to talk about and uh, sometimes it's even good uh, to go back and brush up on these skills that we thought uh, we knew from linear algebra and, and, uh, and optimization so um, to, to set the stage we collect all the images or the, the features now into a matrix and the labels we put into a matrix as well typically that's um, I mean, we have to make sure now that basically the order in which you put them into the matrix does not matter for the final result. Because these guys are supposed to be independent. Once you put something in a matrix, there's somehow an ordering which you don't have in a set. Okay, so um, we have to kind of keep an eye out that nothing, no one gets hurt by, by, by this notation. But it makes our lives a little bit easier because then we can talk about big Y and big C and not have I's and J's floating around all the time. Um, okay. So then we want to find a classification problem or in the first part actually a prediction pro um, uh, function. So we'll do regression first um, so that uh, f evaluated at yj with the current weights is approximately equal to, to c. So um, let's uh, talk about what is f, that is a linear model, and what, is, uh, what does it mean to be approximately equal? Of course it's the least squares. That's the easiest thing to start with. Um, so the model looks then like so. So you take, you have f and you have the y and the w and the b. Um, and, I, and, I, and I just remind you that uh, I use this, this data trick sometimes, but not all of the time. Because sometimes I actually want to expose what are the weights in this, in this network or in this, um, in this model. So here's the w and b. And so how do you get to a prediction? You take uh, the w, you multiply it with y, so every column on its own gets multiplied. Then you have this um, bias here, so that's basically the, uh, the constant shift that you have in a fine model. Uh, you also need to incorporate, and to make this uh, like a really exact formula, what, what I do here is I take b, which is supposed to be a column vector, and I multiply it with en transpose. So en stands for me for a vector that only has ones in there. And if you do that, basically you replicate the b n times. Um, and this should be approximately equal to c. If you are in a, in a MATLAB uh, regime, you can do things that you're not allowed in linear algebra. You could uh, take this matrix that you get out of here and just type plus b. Okay? And uh, I put this slide at some point because I was asked, and sometimes we write papers in the MATLAB notation and people ask me, about it, so what, do you, what does it actually mean to add a vector to a matrix? And um, it's a very basic question, but uh, this should be answered now, uh, once and for all, because uh, later on I will just add a vector to a matrix, and when I do that, I mean exactly that. Okay? No one gets, gets, uh, no one gets hurt from that. Um, okay? So that is a very basic model. I want to kind of simplify that. Um, well of course I can write it in different forms, so I can also think about and, um, having the y here and in the last row I just, for every point I add a 1, okay? And what that allows me to do is then to just lump these two guys 
into the W and say I have a linear model and no affine model, okay? Um, that is uh, one thing I want to do here because uh, then um, I don't have to talk about W's and B's. I just assume if you want to add a bias, you take your data, you add a one yourself, and then you can uh, use uh, whatever regression model that we have. Okay? Um, and once, once you have uh, done, done that, you can write it as a, uh, as a minimization problem where you minimize with respect to W um, the residual WY minus C in a Frobenius norm square. Okay? Um, if you look at this problem here, then um, if, you're, if you're an expert on, op on optimization, you would uh, probably find out that um, if you have the first row of W, so these are all your optimization variables, the first row of W is independent of the second row of W. Okay? Everyone sees that? Okay, great. So if I had more space on this slide, I could even write you down one regression problem per, n, per class or per, per output, okay? And that, of course, is how, what you should do um, uh, if you want to have a really fast method because then you can use uh, as many w uh, workers as you, as you want, okay? Um, and um, that is a specific property of the regression problem. So in classification, that will change actually later. Um, if you also, if you if you if you want, I mean, you could uh, think about um, making this uh, W here a vector, and then you would uh, in the Hessian you would see that uh, that has a block structure, which you can exploit at that level as well. Okay, um, I want to rewrite this because um, this is an awkward way to write a least squares problem. Um, I want to write it as uh, a x minus uh, something. And the way to do that is you say that, okay, this is equivalent clearly if I transpose the residual. So that brings the W on the right hand side. It now becomes a W transpose. Okay, we have to deal with that. But uh, we can then say, so this is a MATLAB notation here. So we have the, the jth row is um, basically given as uh, the argument of this. And this is now a regression problem where W now is a vector and everything is like in a linear algebra textbook. And you can go through um, all the different uh, CJs in here. Um, so that's um, kind of the first. So the C, again, what was that? It was a matrix NC by N. So we take the first row of it and we make that our vector in the regression. Okay? Um, and again, the bias is easy to add. Uh, you just add it to the, to the matrix uh, uh, for the Ys. Okay? So what do we know about least squares? Um, this is supposed to be a reminder where we will go uh, maybe a little bit quicker but also happy to you know now brush up on, on everything that got lost some plan some time um, so if you have a x minus b um, then we will assume okay hopefully a has a non-trivial null space um, let's think about what would an, what would a trivial null space be here maybe I need to go back to this uh, previous slide here so the A is uh, Y transpose. So Y transpose would be uh, the number of, of examples and the basically each column would be a data point. Okay? For all the examples. So um, I think in, in the big data regime that uh, we want to embark on, let's assume we have more rows than we have columns in that matrix that we get. But um, when we say we don't want to have a, uh, we wa or when we say we want to have a non-trivial null space, then what we are saying is that there is no linear dependency in the features, basically no redundancy. If you have that, uh, okay, maybe you can just remove that. Since you're training a linear model, that will not affect uh, your ability to to fit. Um, if so, then A transpose A, uh, the normal equations have a unique solution. Um, uh, so we could just uh, solve that, solve those. Um, if you've taken a numerical linear algebra class, we ho strongly discourage you from actually doing this. You would want to not form this matrix to square the condition number. You would want to do a QR factorization. Um, or in MATLAB, you want to be actually really lazy and just type A backslash B and you're done. It does the right thing. No, uh, I mean, it's a trivial thing, but uh, just uh, 
just to point that out. However, um, there is still so so I, I want to kind of set the stage also to some insights about uh, these uh, methods like SGD and not STD. So think about uh, doing this so really uh, a backslash b as being your really nice optimization method. I mean that gets you really to the minimum, right? There are some least squares problems where you know that the minimum is not what you want. So think about image processing where this B is, you know, like a noisy image that you have and you want to denoise it. You, you know you don't like the noisy image, so better, better not to compute it in the first place. So that would be one reason to go to iterative methods. Uh, the other reasons are they are, they are faster. Um, they're more interesting also because uh, there's actually a lot of things you can do to tweak them. There's a huge variety you can try. Um, so I want to talk about iterative methods from more like a regularization perspective. Um, so because sometimes the iterates that you have there is not just about where, where you get with the method, it's also about the way how you get there. So the iterates themselves are really interesting. And I put uh, references here actually quite a lot uh, for computational inverse problems because that's my bias that I carry with me um, the whole time. So here is for example one of them um, that is um, the, a method called CGLS um, you should know about that when you solve least squares problems um, there it has a property namely that the residual so K is now my, my iteration index the um, iterations are satisfying that the norm of the residual goes down which means that, and, and they actually go to exactly the value you would get from a backslash b. May not be zero, but you would actually find the minimizer um, uh, with, it, with that method. So if you start from x equal to zero, then there's a second property to, uh, to it that basically the norm of x goes up. So we saw that in the polynomial fitting um, in, in the previous lecture where basically if you really want to fit all your data with a, with a high degree polynomial, the entries are going to be large. And one way out is of course to just penalize the strength of them, but with uh, CGLS you have an option also to say, hey, I stop at the right time. Okay? And uh, you can encode that then, so this goes down, this goes up, um, and uh, this plot here, unfortunately we can't see the label, only I can do that, um, is basically the norm of x versus the residual. Okay? And you can see that in the first iterate, so you start from here, zero norm in x and a high, high residual, and then you go down as you go. And um, probably we can eyeball where to stop. Okay? So anyone wants to go all the way? Probably not, right? I mean, every iteration here has the same cost and it doesn't really get your, your, your loss function down or your regression function down, but you pay a big price with really big updates here. So we probably all want to stop exactly here. That's why um, this, uh, this plot here is also called the L curve, because uh, for least squares problems it always looks like an L. And uh, the kink in the L gives you a nice trade-off between fitting the data and complexity of a model. Okay, so those tools you, we, we know very well how to deal with from numerical linear algebra. Um, so then you could also, um, so now this is all training what we've done. We've just trained our least, least squares model. The next question would be, um, if I give you two solutions, and uh, I want to make this comment. So when you use Tikhonov regularization, which uh, now is called weight decay, okay, it's, but it's the same thing, um, then you have a parameter lambda that's uh, called the regularization parameter that you need to pick. Uh, for the lambda here, I can give you exactly the same plot. Okay, um, there's a relation between the lambda and iteration index in some sense. So the iteration index in a CGLS I would also call it a regularization parameter because I know that if I pick that number small I have more regularization than if I pick that number large. So in some sense you can use these methods that uh, basically optimize the lambda and optimize the iteration index uh, interchangeably I mean with a few minor tweaks. Um, and uh, in SGD for example so I mean in machine learning, not everyone uses this weight decay, or I still prefer the old name Tikhonov. Okay, um, 
but what, what you can also do is you can run your SGD and just stop it early, which is, uh, which is actually very nice. Or make it so that it uh, has a lot of noise, so that it doesn't really overfit. So these uh, things are really related in that, in that sense. And for least squares, I think you can make this uh, like, a, like a real argument. This is more like a hand wavy uh, thing that, that I'm doing. Um, but now, say you have two solutions, x1 and x2. Um, actually, if you look at the norms and the residuals, you could now think about also making this a criterion. So if I give you, for example, an x1 and an x2, and the x1 has a bigger norm and a bigger residual, then you know, okay, so that's uh, clearly not, a, not, not the best solution you can do. I would prefer the other one. Because with less, uh, less big entries, you fit the data better. Um, but you can also think about tricky cases, where one has a smaller norm, but, uh, but a larger residual, and, and vice versa. So those are then, uh, of course, tricky to, 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 to do. Um, so one technique you can apply then is what's called cross-validation. So you kind of gauge during the training how well the model does um, on new examples. Um, and there already we get to very thin ice that if you want to uh, practice machine learning, I want to kind of warn you a little bit about that. Um, to not make, make, make a very common uh, mistake, especially in the beginning. So you pick uh, some cross validation, so the ACV and CCV. So these are now examples that you take out. So you take rows out of your matrix and out of your vector B. Put them aside and you fit the, um, the model just with the remaining uh, data points that you have. And then in the end, what you look at is, so if x1, for example, so there you don't care too much about the norm of x1 and how well it fits the data, because you know it's just the training data, and you're not so much interested in the training data. So you plug them both into your model, and say the x1 uh, miraculously performs better than the x2. Then we would call that a better solution. I mean, hopefully. Okay. So that is a cross-validation. You pick the one that works best on the set that you're not optimizing. But now you already see that this is kind of a really, uh, really dangerous argument because then if you have a cross-validation set, you can you know, tweak your regularization parameters so that you do very well on that. So um, I like to write this down actually. What um, ma much of machine learning research is actually solving the following problem but not admitting to it. Um, and the problem is like so, so you want to find lambda star, you know, iteration index, regularization parameters, uh, number of layers, whatever is, is in there, such that you minimize the validation loss, okay? And I have here the x of lambda. So what is x of lambda? x of lambda is basically the minimizer of, um, oh, sorry, this should be, in, should be a b. So uh, basically the, the loss of the trending data plus some uh, regularization that depends on lambda. So it's in the easiest case. So this problem is very well known. It's a bi-level optimization problem. Okay? And uh, especially for linear models, there are efficient ways actually to solve that kind of problem. So what do you do? You say that the x of lambda is giving by, given by the normal equations. So that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a linear system that you need to solve. You plug that in here. You get something that depends non-linearly but convexly on, on the lambda. And then you use uh, fmin bound or fmin search or, so, or something like that because it's just a 1D search that you, you, that you need to carry out. Okay? Um, so you could do that. Um, will it be very successful? I don't know. But implicitly that's what, what, uh, what's been tried. So you try a few models, you look at the validation misfit, and then you pick the one that is best. You just don't do it systematically by, by writing it down as a bi-level problem. Um, so that brings us to a very important slide when you actually want to do machine learning and when you look at, for example, these data sets that you can download uh, online. Um, typically there is a final testing set. Actually, in the better competitions, there is no final testing set. So if you want to create a machine learning test, uh, then you keep that set for yourself, okay? Because otherwise, guess what happens? Uh, people will say, okay, I take all the trending data, I call the test data, I call it validation data, and then, you know, I kind of repeat, I mean, it's kind of an infinite loop almost. So uh, if, if it's a serious and if it's a meaningful competition also, um, then you want to keep that private. So 
Um, and if you want to just play around on yourself, you want to take all the data that you have, make three groups. You can uh, think about what would be good sizes you want. Depends also on how many data points you have. You use the uh, training data to estimate the x of lambda. Uh, you use the cross-validation to use the lambda to get a good lambda implicitly or explicitly solving this bi-level problem and then in the end uh, what you what you put in your paper is uh, the performance of the test set or I would put all the three of them because then we, we you can see okay I solved the training problem very well okay I generalize on the validation data and and so on um, but uh, again I mean like uh, for most of the examples that, that we, we talk here about they're not so serious I mean they are basically cat and dog images or MNIST images or so there I actually probably would even recommend in the beginning also sometimes to do what we used to call the inverse crime in inverse problems to look at everything all the time uh, but just be, be mindful that uh, with a big enough neural network we saw we can fit anything so with a we can fit basically the test data all the time if we train on it but that's not the purpose okay good um, so yeah and you're not allowed to use a to use a test only until the very beginning okay so what do we do for classification so um, that is kind of the first nonlinearity that we're going to add to the model because um, in a linear model there's no way that we get values in the unit simplex all the time okay we could make it so I mean we could add a constraint on the output of the linear model that says okay they all have to be non-negative and they have to sum to one that's still going to be a convex problem but it's going to be a, a least squares problem with constraints and constraints not so easy uh, especially inequality constraints uh, so if you want to avoid that we should do what everyone does um, that is uh, called a logistic regression so here what you do is um, instead of just taking the output from the linear model um, F, uh, Fy um, which again can have entries all over the place you apply a transformation so this is called the logistic sigmoid um, and uh, let's see if we got that right so um, what are the limits so when this argument here becomes big, that whole thing goes to zero. Okay, so when does it become big? It becomes big when the f here is negative. So we kind of assume that when the linear model outputs a negative number, it says it's not in that class. That's why I, why I put the minus there. Um, um, okay, and if it uh, outputs a positive number, then this guy, guy here vanishes and the whole thing goes to 1 and it's bounded between 0 and 1 okay so in linear classification that's exactly what you, what you will end up with um, okay um, so now we have a new way to generate a model I would still call it a linear model because that is basically all but this last uh, little step um, and we'll see much worse uh, later on so you can extend this when you have more than so logistic regression you only use if you have two classes okay if you have more than two classes you need to be a little bit more creative uh, one way to look uh, for for solutions is multinomial logistic regression so if you have more than two classes then we said that the uh, the C observed uh, so the label that you have uh, should be a vector of length n c all the entries between 0 and 1 sum up to 1 so basically the unit simplex okay so there what you what you want to do is um, so this uh, notation wise uh, becomes a little bit tricky so I give you y w okay then I apply the exponential to it not the matrix exponential simple exponential just component wise everything gets uh, exponentiated uh, then I have uh, my favorite en again, but this time it's an enc. So it's uh, for each class I add a one into that vector, and I multiply it from the left. So this one will sum up all the values in exp y exp wy. Okay. Um, so this one here will just be a scalar for for every example, and so now I'm, I basically scale the output of this. So that by design, I have numbers between 0 and 1 and that sum to 1. You know, that's by design. And it's uh, one of many possible things you can think about, but that's what's most commonly uh, used, in, used in machine learning. Uh, but we have to remember, I mean, you know, there could be different ways. 
and like if you talk to people from statistics uh, they don't really have a really nice interpretation and a good feeling for those kind of uh, transformations so um, yeah so everything here is, is really ap um, uh, element wise so then the question is, so how well are you doing? So you have this predicted label and you have the actual label. So how should you compare them? We could stick with the regression loss. So you get uh, these labels out. So these are now projected down to the, to the unit simplex and uh, put them in and uh, compare them with the Frobenius norm, which again, as we learned today already, is not a good idea. And here's one more reason why it's not a good idea. Because if you do that, for very simple examples, you add, uh, so this is the objective function, I should say. So the colors here are basically uh, the contour lines. Blue means uh, low value, yellow means high value. Um, I'm thinking about minimization all the time, so I want to go into the value. So some, some place here, or maybe even out of the picture, is my minimizer. But you see, if you, if you are closer, if you've downloaded the slides, there's another local minimizer, or local, local maximizer up here, it seems. Um, and uh, these level sets here are not convex, so going from here to here uh, you increase uh, regression loss. Okay, so if you uh, do this, so you do a, a, mon a monotonic uh, transformation um, in here, you have the least squares loss um, and you are in trouble. And uh, that is uh, really one of the uh, one of one of the important observations. So not only statistically does this not make sense, but it also translates to the optimization. So that's why we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, what we should be using is a cross entropy. So with the cross entropy, everything is nice and smooth, and even you can simplify what you have to a, to a very nice form. Um, and uh, and again, it makes also more sense because you you acknowledge that uh, these are basically discrete uh, probability distributions. Okay, so here's uh, how you would compute that. So if, if I have now uh, many examples here, so I have many columns, I need to twist the notation a little bit. Um, I can still apply the exponential component wise and then I multiply with a diagonal matrix. So diag of a vector for me means that I make a diagonal matrix with all these elements on the vector, just like as m just the same as what MATLAB would do. Um, and if I multiply this from the right, uh, I basically multiply each uh, column in the matrix with the associated um, weight. So that uh, does not really destroy anything or d uh, depends on the order of things. Um, and then the cross entropy, what you do is you take an inner product, so you have a C transpose times log of C. Okay. You put your predicted labels in here, uh, because then with the exponentials, uh, chances are that we can simpli simplify things a little bit. And then you take the trace of that matrix. So that's just one way to write this thing. And uh, of course, you have the negative, uh, uh, negative log here. Um, so this is then, uh, sometimes we call it the softmax cross entropy, because uh, this transformation that we just did in the multinomial logistic regression in uh, machine learning code, that's called the softmax. Uh, because it kind of acts like a max, but it's differentiable, which we like, of course. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's go through that real quick. Um, so if I put in this this model that I have, and uh, with some notation where I have the product denoted by S, I can see. So I have a log here, and then uh, I, I know I can kind of uh, the log of uh, two factors is uh, what is it like the log of each factor and then you add them so multiplication becomes addition you do all these tricks that you can do and in the end uh, and you probably want to use some Hadamard products for efficiency in the end you end up with a very innocent expression like so so you have this term here which is um, linear in S okay there's nothing that's complicated in S. And this term here, um, if you open up a, an optimization textbook, and uh, maybe you know, blow your eyes a little bit, um, in an optimization textbook there is something called the log sum exp. That's uh, one of the, the proofs uh, I think everyone has to do once, that the log sum exp is uh, convex. And how, how can we see the structure? So we have the log, we have the exp, but, and we note that this E transpose thing is just adding stuff up, so that's a sum. Okay, so this means, so you have a linear plus a convex, so that is going to be convex. It's going to be convex in S. We have to see though that S is W times Y, 
w are all weights so um, since they enter linearly here um, you keep the convexity but you're also convex by the way in the y which is uh, something you could exploit when you think about fooling the network which is called an adversary adversarial example or adversarial training um, so this is a, a nice convex function that you have so you can minimize it in all sorts of ways before you do that I would recommend you do one one more thing because if you have an exp in your model numerical analysis people know that there might be some some issues so what you do here is uh, you can subtract so you can can realize that you can subtract anything constant um, from from the images you could even have uh, I think uh, subtract a vector as long as it's uh, kind of constant so a vector like from each column you can have a different constant that you subtract that's what I'm trying to say okay and you should do that um, because otherwise if you implement this naively you will run into overflow if you add this uh, minus s here and I would pick it um, I'm going to show you how to pick it yes so what you do is you take the maximum um, of wy along the first dimensions you subtract that you make sure that you only have negative numbers here that you throw into the x so then the worst thing that can happen is an underflow but uh, that just means that you don't have any energy in that class anyway so you drop it to zero um, so if you implement this um, please do please do please do make this shift um, um, but otherwise it's a fairly simple problem uh, you can uh, do whatever you want with it um, so um, it's a smooth convex so you can do steepest descent you can do Newton like methods is probably what I prefer most of the time um, you can use a stochastic gradient descent if you have no other option for, for these kind of problems I don't really see a big benefit of using it um, we've done some work on ADMM um, to make the problem even easier to boil it basically down to a least squares problem uh, but there are tons of um, tons of ways to solve this okay so probably uh, so here would be actually an excellent uh, time time for questions if any any, any of them are there because now I'm just going to summarize the linear model part uh, so what we've done, we have, we've uh, introduced deep learning, which is a subset but not equal to machine learning. So we want to um, want to uh, talk about that. There are risks and promises of uh, those data-driven models. Uh, we want to make sure we generalize. We did some review here. Um, something I did not mention, but I think I put a reference to the slide, is what's called generalized cross-validation. That is something you should be using for least squares. Um, Multinomial logistic regression we did. Uh, we, uh, lead, we obtained a convex problem and uh, we thought about linear models. So linear models, again, um, they are really the foundations because most of the deep networks will contain a linear model. Typically, the last layer of your, of your neural network will be a linear model. Okay, so if you don't know how to deal with that last layer, then it's, it's very hard to make any progress. Um, but they are not really powerful. And um, so, anyway, so I could take questions now. Um, do you see any? Otherwise, I can uh, show you some code. Um, and we can do both at the same time, too. So you can also ask me questions then. Okay, um, so I thought I put uh, together uh, a small example just to illustrate also that linear models are not really that bad. You can actually do quite a lot of things with linear models. So let's see uh, what happens here. So, so here's my learning problem. And um, so yeah, hopefully the colors come through. Do, do you want me to make the uh, points di uh, bigger? I can, uh, this is live, I can do that. Okay, uh, so we have some blue points in, in, this, in this region, we have some red points in this region. Um, which linear model should I be using? Logistic, Logistic regression, for sure. Um, how well do you think I can do? Well enough? Well enough? No. Uh, we have to increase our expectations. So with the linear model, so I run this uh, thing really quickly, I can show you the output too. That's how well I can do with the linear model. So just to parse that picture, so it's the original point cloud in the middle and then these uh, solid colors here is uh, basically 
so my classifier is this function f, it takes a 2D point and it gives me a label. I do this for all the points on the pixel grid and that's the image I plot. So it's like a visualization of a 2D function if you wish. Um, so basically I think I got it about 50%, maybe a little bit more because it uh, really optimizes this thing so if my samples are a little bit more concentrated on one side it'll fall over there. Oh, that's a new feature. Cool. Um, okay, so, so that makes sense to you. Um, let's just look a little bit on the, on the output here. So just to give you an, an impression also for fans of the SGD method. So this is a hand-coded Newton method, or Newton CG I should say. So it's a Newton where I'm not really taking the linear algebra too seriously. Um, and uh, it took me about, so here you see the objective function, so you see the norm of the gradient which is the stuff you really want to uh, put to zero and you see that basically after my stopping criterion is, is not very good because after seven iterations I basically have a uh, I'm done, right? That's what you should be seeing. So try that with an SGD. Uh, we have it in here, so it's not, not, not that uh, well. But then you have the case closed. However, it doesn't really matter to talk about the optimization. Yeah, so in the end there is just line searches and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, um, doesn't really matter too much to talk about the optimization because we have a very, f very fast way, let's say, to get a bad result. Because 50-50 is not really uh, what's getting your paper published. So okay, let's, let's brainstorm a little bit. Um, so how could we do better? Does anyone have an idea? So far you haven't been talking to me very much. So does anyone have an idea of what to do um, to, to do better in this example? Huh? Uh, yes, we could go to nonlinear models, but that's not for now, right? We, haven't, we, do, we don't know what that is yet. Okay? Do you have an idea? Yeah. Yeah, that is actually a good suggestion. If I if I like if I hear what I want to hear, um, so I want to do something called feature engineering. So my features, if I if I look at the the picture again, my features here are not linearly classifiable. Okay, so rather than tackling it from the modeling part, where I make a model that is powerful enough to tackle the data. I can engineer features so that they are linearly separable. <coughs> okay? We go to polar coordinates. We go to polar coordinates, and I, I prepared that uh, for you. So if we do this, so we can basically, we can choose our features whatever, in whatever way we like. Uh, let me actually make the font a little bit bigger. So um, what we can do, let's uncomment this. So we can take the original matrix Y and we com can compare the radius and some, some angle. So then we go to polar coordinates um, and we can now make, we overwrite the feature matrix by having the radius and the, and the angle. And here I want to stay in 2D. I could actually, if I wanted to make sure I do better and better and better, I could uh, kind of keep adding stuff to it. But, you know, we, we keep things simple. So, so um, everyone fine with that? Let's look at what we've done. Um, so let's uh, clear all, everything. So now our plot looks like so. So that's our feature matrix. How about elliptic coordinates? Well, that will come next, probably. <laughs> let's take it step by step. Uh, because to be honest, I mean, I was on an airplane when I thought about this, and then elliptic coordinates, oh, that is too, too complicated. So I'll show you a way around that. Um, but I knew that they are going to be like, so far my assumption is that, that you know, on the math, I mean, you beat me any day of the, of the week. Uh, on the computation, I think I can, I can teach you a few, few tricks here. So um, this I knew coming to Pisa, uh, I don't even try to compete. So, okay, so this is how well I could do um, uh, over then. So let's run the whole thing, see what we get. So the optimization really doesn't care, and the plotting does. Uh, I need to update the plotting. Because um, now, kind of I put my box in the wrong place. Sorry about that. Um, but basically, so this line, since it's a linear model, we can ex extrapolate. So we go down here, and I think the colors are flipped. 
but we do, if I read the numbers, we do a little bit better, like 13% or something like that. So now, how do we get a perfect job? Um, so we could go to elliptic coordinates, or we could do something that uh, machine learning people would always have in the code. It's called normalization. So you take your data, and uh, for example, in this line here, you remove the mean, and in this line, you divide by the standard deviation. You just memorize those numbers in the end, because if you are given new data, you need to do exactly the same transform. So don't throw this information away like I do here. Um, and if you do all that, then it's still with a, with a bug in the plottings, um, but I can show you actually that the loss here So the loss here now becomes almost zero. So that's a training error and also validation error. And that way, since now the data is normalized, I didn't show you the data actually, so I should have done that. Um, to show this. So here, that is, the, that is the data now after the rescaling. So there's no parabola any more left. Okay? So that is uh, just, before we get too excited about deep learning, um, we can actually get very far without deep learning. Um, people have a lot of expertise in, in these transformations. And that's actually also to show you that the example um, that we just looked at is actually very trivial in many respects. Okay? Um, so, any more questions? Because if not, I would just... Oh yeah, there's one. Microphone? Mm -hmm. Ah, I have the microphone, sorry. <coughs> hey, so, kind of, kind of quick. Um, so the problem isn't linear, but it's kind of linearizable. Is there any way to characterize these kind of problems? That is a very nice question um, that I don't know the answer to. But I know that not every problem that we are interested in will be linearizable. So, I mean, or at least there, there is no known way how to linearize any problem. Because, of course, here, how we came up with this, that's the review that thought process, is I plotted the data for you, and you generated the, the ideas very quickly by looking at it. So now think about uh, stuff happening in a four-dimensional feature space. Like if I'm unlucky and I plot the wrong two dimensions or wrong three dimensions, um, you will not be so, 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 yeah, you won't be so lucky so easily. So, uh, but yeah, the, whether or not you can say a priori by looking at the data, I mean, sure, one thing you can do is you can take the data, run a linear model, and see if you can classify. If you can classify, then you know it's linearly classifiable. So numerically, you can check that. Uh, like just analysis wise I wouldn't know but um, probably looking at numerically would make the most sense since uh, you have some discrete data anyway okay but a, but a very good question um, and actually it's a question that uh, I can use to motivate and I will break into the next part I would say because I still have like uh, 20 minutes on my clock um, we can go a little bit earlier depending on how tired people are but uh, I have more time so I will break into the next uh, part and you have to promise me, though, that you remember that tomorrow. So I'll go very briefly only on the, on the o overlap. Oh, yeah. Or, or you can keep asking questions, so then you don't have to remember. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it's very difficult to know whether a problem is linear, linear is, can be put in a linear way or not. Linearly right? separable. Lin or exactly. Do you know if uh, any problem can be locally uh, make linear? The, the question, the way I ask you, the, the question is because sometimes you can have a very complicated model, let's yeah. say a deep learning model, that then you don't understand in the sense that you are not able to explain why the method works. And so a way of explaining, at least locally with respect to the specific uh, data set that you're looking at, is to approximate locally with a linear model. Do you know any result, whether, you know, any problem can be linearized or not? Uh, or um, so... First of all, it's a very tempting thing to say yes, um, but uh, whenever there's a question with any, I would say no. Um, so 
like think about th this way. So maybe you know I don't have an answer to it that is right prepared, but maybe I can give you uh, uh, some idea and maybe we can have a dialogue on this. So it, for example, if you look at finite elements, if you have a, a, a non-convex uh, but nice function, like a, like a continuous function, we know that we can approximate it very well with finite elements, which is basically a piecewise linear model, if you pick very simple finite elements. Okay, so in that sense, you know, I would be uh, would be uh, tempted to say, yeah, you know, you probably can do this. If you now think about in finite elements, you would of course do adaptive meshing, so that you have only very few uh, pieces in in your in your puzzle. And I think that's what, what you can come very far with. I think in machine learning, the most related thing would be decision trees. So decision trees are kind of like an octree uh, type of uh, discretization that you can know from, from PDEs. Uh, and I think you know, if the function is sufficiently nice, which means typically smoothness, you would probably uh, get, get very far. The question, though, is then, um, OK, how do, you de how do you define all these pieces? Um, and uh, how do you uh, do this? In, like meshing is is hard. Oh, it's probably not hard in one D. It's uh, it's easy to solve in two D. It's more or less soft in three D, but still hard. But if you go to higher dimensions, it's, it's it's becoming increasingly hard. So, but yeah, probably you can do that. So, the, and actually, some of the networks um, um, w we are going to talk about, you can interpret as a uh, piecewise linear model. So you saw, I know you saw them already. You saw these ReLU activations. So if you think about a ReLU, what, what is it? Zero and then just a linear. So you could think about, um, if, you are if, if there are finite element persons in the room, they might be better suited for this. But I think I can take a bunch of ReLUs to build a head function with two of them. And so now that I have a head function, I can have many of them to build a piecewise linear model. Okay. So the thing we could set that up is a learning problem. Okay, um, any more questions? Okay, great. Then let's challenge your guys' memories. Okay, so let's do nonlinear models. And with going to nonlinear models, here is uh, an idea based on our recent experience. Um, I want to push the feature extraction. The long-term vision is I push the feature extraction onto the nonlinear model. Because in general, I don't want to plot very high dimensional data. Okay? So that's, but that's my interpretation also that I used, that I drew on very much uh, in the beginning. So here's the, the, the big picture idea. And that's actually an example we just uh, experienced. Um, we have our input features. So if we can somehow transform to them to something like this, it does not look as nice as, as the polar transformation with, you know, removing bias uh, means and standard deviations uh, looked like uh, just a minute ago. But this transformation is a learned transformation. So I've obtained it by training a nonlinear model. And I'll show you how exactly I trained that in the, in the remaining lectures. But that's kind of the goal of the trick. Uh, so sometimes, uh, and uh, you know, I will say, so sometimes we will embed the points into a higher dimensional space to do this trick, um, just to add more flexibility to it. Here the idea would be, so if I gave you this as a task, I give you these, linear, these input features, you can't linearly separate them in 2D. Um, one legit way to go about the problem is, I print out this data on a piece of paper. If I have done that, I bend it a little bit from all sides, and then I fit a hyperplane through it. Would that work? I think that would work. So here's one uh, thing if you think about the width of a neural network. You could, you could basically learn that. So you could say, okay, make the width. I only have two input features. Let's make three hidden layers. And uh, then we, we, should, we, could be, we could basically take a data set that is not linearly classifiable into a higher dimensional space and hopefully get lucky if we do this in a, in a smart way. Because this bending thing is still something we need to figure out. Okay, but that is really the idea of now adding nonlinearity. Um, okay, so linear fitting we've seen. So here's, um, here's a, a, a big picture slide. Um, that I, I like giving um, in, in, in a class. So I have a, 
uh, I have a numerical method for machine learning class actually at Emory. And uh, there, you know, there's a mix of students, so it's always good actually to, to go over some basics. So if you look at uh, this problem up here, and uh, I have to explain you really what that, what that meant. So I switched back, I think, um, because we need to switch back to having uh, the wy equal to c. So remember in the least squares I did this flip around so that I have everything uh, like ax minus b. We have to kind of, uh, once we go to nonlinear models we have to keep the notation right. Probably I should show you the previous slide because that one actually does that. So we go back to this original problem c is equal to wy. y can have the bias in there already. That's good. Um, we know that if the rank of y, so y again is a matrix nf by n, n will be very large, big data, um, and the rank here will generally be less than n, because you have not enough uh, rows, okay, then there may be no solution. So the previous uh, talk was about using least squares, because this one always has a solution, but we may not like it. It might just be a 50-50 classification, okay? Um, so then the idea is that um, I replace my features by a nonlinear function. So if you are in SVMs, you have these kernel functions or something like that. Um, but uh, here I do a very simple thing. I have basically a KY and then a sigma. So it's a single layer of a neural network. Okay, I can do that. So now I have new data and I can see whether or not I can classify it. Um, so that's my idea. And then here's, here's a claim, and sometimes people fall for it, but uh, not you guys. Um, so here's an argument. So, if I, so I plug in the sigma ky into here, and if I just look at the sizes of my, of my linear regression problem, then in the beginning I'm in this regime. So this is my matrix y, it is nf by n, and I don't have, um, uh, so it's basically a short matrix, but it's very wide which means in a least squares problem like, like ours, we will not be able to fit all the data. Okay? Um, so here's what I do is, I multiply this matrix Y from the left hand side with K. And in K, in my network architecture, I can specify what, where are the entries. I say, okay, all over the place, fully connected. But I can pick the number of rows in K. So what happens if I pick a very large number of rows in K? I can make this, so this is an, under, this is an overdetermined least squares problem. I can turn this into an underdetermined least squares problem. Okay? This will also, by the way, increase the number of weights that I need to learn. Okay? Um, and instead of then solving this problem, I solve this bigger least squares problem. Okay, so here's now the thing that we need to talk about this activation function. Maybe first thing, if there is no activation function, how well do you think I can do with this kind of approach? So I take my, my, my matrix Y, I multiply it with K, and now I have a new matrix, and that matrix has more rows and columns. So if I pr print it, it looks like an uh, underdetermined problem. How well do you think that is going to work? Sigma x equal to x, no nonlinearity. Equal. Equal. I, I will do no progress, I will just burn more power. Okay? So why? Because of course if you, if you multiply a matrix with another matrix, the rank doesn't really change. I mean you just generate a bunch of... Well, I don't know, let's save that yeah. word. Huh? Yeah, uh, yeah, you could even go down if you are unlucky. Um, doesn't typically happen because we, I didn't tell you the trick how to choose k. You have to be very unlucky to, to diminish some rank. <laughs> k equals zero is not allowed. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway, so here is now, um, I think one, it's, uh, I think I called it a conjecture because I don't have a proof, um, about how to look at what's called the universal approximation theory of neural networks. Um, so, but, uh, but uh, don't really quote it yet. Uh, we don't have a proof for this one. So here is like a linear algebra, simple way of looking at these approximation theories of neural networks. And later in this uh, class, we will have experts on approximation theory that will probably um, give a much more, much more sophisticated 
um, way to look at this. So here's my algorithm. So I take the data y um, and I multiply it with a matrix K that is sufficiently tall and I apply some nonlinear function in here. Okay? Empirically what I observe is so okay, so if you don't have the nonlinear function, we know nothing happens to the rank. But empirically what I observe is when I pick this k big enough, then I actually can make this uh, a like a rank n uh, problem. And then I basically can fit any, this means that I can fit anything. Any vector in Rn you give me, I can fit it. Okay? So that is a, it's not a, not a theorem, but it's a, it's a conjecture that uh, we've been having. Um, so. If you can manage to do, to do that, then you know that you can basically always fit the training data. How well that's going to generalize is the second order question. Okay, but um, but yeah. So and I don't know even where to look for functions. But probably I should talk to Michaela about that. What, if there, if, if anything can be proven for these element-wise functions that you can uh, that you can add there, or yeah, other people too. I mean, like if you're interested in these kind of things. But it's for me the most uh, intuitive way to look at these new uh, approximation theorems because we can also already see a catch of these uh, theorems that um, we can we can push the experts later this week on. Um, can I tell you what M is? Like how, how many rows do I need to generate? No. I just know there exists an M. So if I pick it large enough, then my observation is that I will at some point break even. So you generate a bunch of really big problems, but you don't really have a guideline. I mean, I want, what I want is a guideline. I want to say, okay, if, we give, if you give me this matrix, uh, add uh, 20 rows, use this nonlinearity, because also that's a question, which nonlinearity should you be using? Um, we don't know. Um, but um, it's actually, I'm sorry, my last slide for today. Um, it's, it's, um, it's more serious than you think, because here is one way um, to, to go about uh, the whole nonlinear transformation problem. So first of all, I mean, how do you choose uh, sigma? So in the early days, you, you hear some things about neurons and stuff like that. So there was a 10H, you say, you know, at some point neurons uh, get act they are doing nothing, then they get activated, then they level out or something like that. Uh, not so much my favorite thing to talk about, um, but at least you know these functions you get out, they are somewhat smooth, they're bounded, you can make some arguments and relate them to certain things. Nowadays what everyone uses is the ReLU or the max function in here. Um, it's uh, not really nice from optimization point of view, so it's not differentiable, for example, but uh, okay, if you use an SGD, like that is the least worry you have. Um, and then the question is, how do you pick K and B? That's a more interesting one. And um, we will uh, go through two things, so I'll show you an example tomorrow, um, where you just pick them randomly. And by randomly, I of course mean rand n, okay? Just pick rand n, you choose the size, uh, maybe you can choose the standard deviation if you like. That's about it. Um, this is uh, branded as what's called extreme learning machine. You should look that up. I mean, there are heated, heated discussions online whether or not that's a legit way to solve the problem. Um, it's oftentimes, uh, honestly, I, I, I think it's a great way to get a first feeling for your data. Because I mean, if, if random, so if you do deep learning, you realize that you burn a lot of energy in your training. So the first thing I want to see is, do you do better than me uh, who just picks some random numbers? Uh, first of all, who, do, who does linear regression? Then if, that if I run out of options there, I pick some random numbers, I solve another linear regression. Okay, it's a little bit bigger, but I can still do it. Do you do better with your deep learning than, than I do? Um, you should because uh, so basically the idea in deep learning would be or neural network training would be you optimize these weights. So now um, you can think about that already um, if, if you want to optimize those weights. So you look now for W, Y and B, uh, yeah, uh, w, no, w, K and B at the same time. Okay, so you add more variables to your learning problem but the hope is maybe you can uh, get a smaller problem out. So maybe I don't have to take this really, really, really obs obscenely big matrix uh, if I'm smart and if I can optimize this thing. So, so that's basically what is done in uh, neural networks. 
Um, and again, deep learning will then be the extension where we say, okay, we not only have one of these nonlinear transformations, uh, we'll have a bunch of them uh, applied consecutively. But uh, probably with that, I'll, I'll stop a little bit for questions. Um, and then I will let you go for today. Um, and I'm also going to hang around for a few more minutes if you have other questions. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for, for, for these first two sessions. And there are more to come, I think, tomorrow and on Wednesday and then two on Friday. No? I probably should have said I, I will leave right away after the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's uh, thank uh, all the speakers uh, again. And